Greetings. Um, welcome to the CUGA session on the impact of climate change on health in the Caribbean and health opportunities from climate action across the North America. We are very pleased to um, be with you today. We have a fantastic panel for the next three hours, um, beginning um, with introductions. Um, uh, every participant will um, share their views for about 20 minutes. We'll have two question and answer sessions um, and then um, be able to um, interact, uh, interact in a, in a Q&A way with you. Please put your um, questions in the Q&A um, for our presenters. We will not entertain questions until those two uh, Q&A sections. I'm Marine Lichtfeld, um, Dean and Professor um, in Environmental and Occupational Health at the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, my research is at the intersect of chemical and non-chemical stressors. And for the last decade or so, I, I uh, spent my time in uh, uh, examining the impact of climate and health um, on, the, on the Caribbean. And so um, I will begin with sharing an overview um, of the impact on climate and health in the Caribbean and followed by the other speakers as I introduce themselves. I want to make sure everybody sees the slides. Um, and so the objectives of my presentation um, today are to provide an overview of the climate impacts on human health, specifically focused on the Caribbean, um, and to examine some of the challenges and opportunities for climate action. We know uh, that climate is very complex and this is not a, a, a notion that is new to us, but what I wanted to point out is whether you focus on air pollution or severe weather or increasing uh, allergens or water and food supply, wherever you focus on from an, from an impact related to climate change, uh, there is an impact on human health. Very important to and often forgotten is the, the focus on and, and the influence of social determinants of health and vulnerability um, as climate drivers on, on outcomes. And so this is an adaptation um, from my colleague, Dr. Petz, on his seminal um, article to look at what the impact is on climate change. Um, when we look at direct health effects, those are often well understood um, from storm floods and urban heat island effects up to then um, ultimately relating to injuries and death and heat stress. What's less well understood are the indirect health effects. And my colleague, Dr. Clark, will talk more about food security and safety, but issues of water resources and safety particularly in the Caribbean factor-borne diseases and air pollution and overall, wherever we live, issues of mental health have direct impact on food-borne diseases, water-borne diseases, uh, infectious diseases, respiratory health, and uh, particularly for mental health, population displacement, overcrowding, ultimately leading to depression and demoralization. And so, as I mentioned before, the, in, the health pathways um, of climate change are very complex and may lead to both direct and indirect health impacts. Here are some of the examples. Uh, if we take extreme weather events, whether they're the drought or flooding, um, we get a, an impact on the reduced food security. Um, looking at um, and impacting a decrease in agricultural yields and ultimately a decrease in access to healthy foods. Um, hurricane and floods um, lead to limited healthcare access, um, exemplified by power outages, 
by interrupted pharmaceutical drug supply chain, by disrupted transportation, particularly for people who live in rural areas, infrastructure damage, especially in hospitals, and ultimately difficulty in evacuations. And so specific to the Caribbean um, and other small island developing states, the, they really contribute minimally, those countries contribute minimally to global greenhouse gas emissions, but yet the disproportionate impact is on these very countries because of size, frequency of extreme weather events as we had last year, small population sizes, geographically remote areas, a rising sea level and limited resources. And so these impacts are expected to increase and will differ and vary by country. The Pan American Health Organization did a survey in about 18 countries and you can see the priorities um, up top, um, beginning with factor borne diseases, water, and weather and emergencies, food security, and waterborne diseases. I want to point out that um, mitigation and mitigation efforts um, for uh, particularly focus on health despair, uh, on health facilities are increasing, but um, are not um, as much of an importance. But uh, there is progress, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we discuss opportunities. And so in the Caribbean, uh, we are facing a triple health threat, um, disproportionate high burden of non-communicable diseases, epidemic and endemic infectious diseases, and fragile, a fragile health in, uh, infrastructure that really is hampering addressing these challenges. And so taking a look at non-communicable diseases and the burdens, particularly cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes account for almost half of the mortalities. Um, a decrease in what traditionally were high priority disease conditions, communicable diseases, have now been matched by non-communicable diseases. The highest socioeconomic inequity we see in the Americas in the Caribbean region. And uh, as I mentioned before, it increased both in intensity and frequency of extreme weather events, including heat waves, and you'll hear from my colleague Mindis about this, are further exacerbating non-communicable diseases and an increase resulting in often an increase in hospital admissions. And so this gives us a, 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 an idea of what the prevalence is of some of the non-communicable diseases. You see diabetes and cancer and chronic respiratory disease, but also the associate risk factors. Um, and I want to point out the high rate of obesity and, um, and overweight. And so with respect to mortality and some of the countries you see the uh, the data here, both for all causes for cancer, as well as heart disease and diabetes. And so we are facing significant health threats, even without um, taking in, in consideration climate change. Wherever we start, and this is PAHO uh, information, wherever we start from climate change, whether we go to the left or the right, ultimately it impacts human health and particularly non-communicable diseases. From an environmental health perspective, here's a translation of what the climate change uh, can challenge us uh, with respect to mercury exposure. In the Caribbean and some countries in Latin America, mercury is heavily used uh, in the context of gold mining. So if you can imagine, um, where, for example, in Suriname, where I am from, we have very high levels of mercury upstream from gold mining areas, in addition to the burden that gold mining is, is posing. So how is that possible? If we can contemplate um, frequency changes in wind direction, leading to an increase in mercury deposition, um, that that impact by itself um, further is exacerbated by higher temperatures, uh, periods of both less and periods of 
more precipitation and strong winds. So whichever element you take, uh, it leads to increased evaporation of mercury, of mercury um, chemical reaction, and particularly methylation of mercury, re, uh, resulting in higher uh, toxicity of mercury, um, less oxygen and lower water uh, minimum levels, forest die off, ultimately leading to uh, less protein sources, fewer protein sources available, and often um, fish is, is the only protein source for many of the, the rural and indigenous communities. And so ultimately more mercury is released. Similarly, if you look at pesticide residues in produce and how uh, climate, is, climate change is impacting that, both higher temperatures, less and more precipitation ultimately lead to increased evaporation of pesticides, more pesticides being deposited in the context of higher uh, temperatures. In the context of less precipitation, we have less runoff, so more concentration of the pesticide, in particularly root vegetables, ultimately leading to um, increased pesticide residues um, in produce and often the produce that are most frequently consumed um, in many communities in the Caribbean. And so with that bleak picture, I want to take us to some opportunities. Um, with respect to non-communicable diseases, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States um, has a regional health project in place funded by the World Bank, which focuses on providing services for people with NCDs um, throughout, uh, but also beyond extreme weather events. Um, from a health systems perspective, PAHO's uh, Smart Hospital Initiative um, is very active. Um, and for example, the Peebles Hospital in the British Virgin Islands was built to PAHO Smart Standards and was able, because of that, able to stay intact um, after many storms. Um, within the Caribbean, there are also uh, resources for public health practitioners and clinicians. For example, the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin is one that comes out quarterly with specific information for health professionals so that decision uh, making can happen based on um, contemporary data. Um, similarly, the Pan American Health Organization has a climate change for health professionals pocketbook um, that further helps clinicians to take actions. There are other opportunities. Uh, the EU CARI Forum Climate Change and Health uh, Project is uh, focused on strengthening climate uh, resilient um, health systems within the Caribbean focus specifically on improving the capacity of Caribbean countries to reduce negative impacts of climate change using a One Health approach. And I'll come back to that. Um, some of the outputs are comprehensive health chapters and national adaptation plans uh, and increased surveillance capacity, particularly focusing on um, health systems. A few years ago, um, several uh, ministers of health came together through the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA, and developed a, a set of strategic imperatives uh, to address climate, uh, climate change and particularly the impact on health. There's six of those, beginning with, and you'll hear from our colleague um, at Maybach more about this, raising awareness of climate change and health through information dissemination. Um, secondly, to strengthen community resilience, so beyond individual resilience to address the cumulative threats um, posed by climate change and severe weather events. And thirdly, and I'll come back to that, um, a multi-sectoral approach and evidence for decision-making using data for decision-making. Um, four, to enhance regional sustainability and resilience, particularly focused on health facilities. Um, fifth, to maximize the benefits of the built environment and climate change. And lastly, but very importantly, uh, to coordinate resources to address climate change impact on health. And so here's an example of how to operationalize one of those strategic imperatives, this one being integrating multi-sectoral data uh, and evidence for decision-making with the overall strategic goal of reducing the impact 
of climate change on health and the environment. Um, this is work in progress. And so uh, here is an example of a measurable objective, a benchmark. Um, the number of member states that include climate indicators in their public health surveillance systems, with the approach being strengthening the, the generation and dissemination of knowledge, um, and ultimately identifying these indicators in surveillance systems throughout Caribbean countries. We know this. We know that there are three conditions that I'm transitioning now to how climate and COVID relate. Um, that the three conditions for a pandemic are, and this is an influenza example, but that there is a new subtype uh, emerging and we've, that we've seen that now with SARS-CoV-2, that it infects humans and causes serious illness. In fact, we lost um, 500,000 people only in our country in the US um, and that it spreads easily from person to person. And so we also know this, we know that there are both direct hosts and intermediate hosts when it gets to influenza. And through Jonathan's work, we see the same cycle. So why did we not act? Why did we not act on time? Um, why we didn't act? Because we did not take a transdisciplinary approach. We did not consider a One Health climate change COVID-19 integrated strategy to address this. We did not consider that animal health and human health are very much in integral and interrelated. And that environmental health is, a, is a, a, a critical part of how we will address climate change. And whether it's through landscape, landscape changes or to biodiversity loss. And so um, here, not only for the Caribbean, but globally, the importance of taking a transdisciplinary approach is critical if to address not only the next pandemic, but overall for us to be able to uh, counter the impact of human health and, um, and cl on, of climate change on human health. So I want to end with acknowledging the funding source, um, uh, NIH, uh, NIH uh, the Fogarty Center, um, and to thank my collabor collaborators, Dr. Abdullah Heath and Dr. Kofod, and leaving you um, my contact um, if you um, would like to connect. And so I will stop sharing um, and uh, introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Barton Clark. Dr. Clark is the executive director for the Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute, CARDI, and previously served as, as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States, the FAO, representative for Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname um, at the FAO office in Trinidad and Tobago. He held various other positions in CARDI, including the country representative for Tobago, Dominica, and St. Lucia, um, and also has been very involved in the organization of Eastern Caribbean states, um, as well as the project manager for EU and uh, USAID. Uh, we're very honored to have um, Dr. Clark uh, join us and his topic is climate change and food security, safeguarding the Caribbean food systems. Please joining me in welcoming Dr. Clark. Thank you very much. Right. Good afternoon. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to be able to um, share with you from an agriculture and, and food security perspective. Um, a little bit about CARDI, um, some aspects of climate change, some of the impacts, the state of food and nutrition security, some, some of the responses to some of the challenges that, that, that we face. Um, so the Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institution was established back in 1974 to cater to the research and development needs of, of, of the member states and to assist in coordinating agricultural research for development across a number of states. The map there shows you our spread from Belize in, out, in, out in the west to Guyana in the south, um, and including in the north, the Bahamas. Our, our vision is a center of excellence, delivering innovation, 
and technology for the region's food sectors. Our mission is to contribute to sustainable development and our, and our core values are, are partnerships, professionalism, accountability, transparency, and people-centeredness. Our strategic, our, our, we have basically um, four program areas, value chain services, which is more the traditional areas of agricultural research for development, institutional strengthening, uh, partnerships and strategic alliances because we recognize that we can't do this on our own and policy and advocacy. In terms of our climate change, um, climate change mitigation and adaptation, uh, our objectives are to implement, adopt innovative, sustainable, climate smart food and agricultural systems, looking at agroecological approaches, um, trying to mitigate the impacts of, of, of pesticides, looking at genetic conservation and biodiversity maintenance, evaluating and looking at tolerant breeze and variety, significant work done in drought tolerance, renewable energy system at the level of the farms, soil and water management and, 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 and climate model. The, our course of action stems from a number of global as well as regional uh, policies. Of course, starting with the, the sustainable development goals, um, the SIDS agenda, you know, embraced within the, the, the small pathway, the Paris Accord addressing climate change issues. In addition to that, of course, and things we have the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, which seeks to integrate the actions and things of the, of the Caribbean, um, as well as there's a Caribbean food nutrition security policy, there's a Caribbean climate change action plan, and, and so on. So that uh, these are all grounded and integrated towards helping the Caribbean to, to, to weather the storm as such, but also to participate fully in, 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 in the global fight to help address issues of climate change and health. As the previous speaker would have indicated, you know, we are of the small island development states, uh, highly susceptible to the climate change. Um, all the productive sectors, manufacturing, tourism, agriculture are are impacted by sea level rise, changes in temperature patterns, changes in rainfall patterns, increasing intensity of, of natural disasters. In fact, there's a Caribbean climate outlook, uh, which is really a report produced by the Climate Studies Group of the University of West Indies at, at Mona, who, who have been principal in helping to shape the Caribbean's input into the Paris Accord and they speak about how that report speaks about how would the climate is likely to unfold over the next 100 years and the kinds of impacts and things that are to be anticipated. Uh, the impacts have been significant and um, the damage that has been caused, the, the impact of the damage. And uh, I have some examples here before you, um, Irma, because every year, you know, we have the traditional hurricane season. But of course, in addition to in, in addition to the, the hurricanes, there are there are floods, there are periods of droughts as well too, and these have all contributed and thing to um, negative impacts on on food and agriculture systems, and by extension, on the healthcare systems. We 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 have, like I said, floods in Guyana, um, Suriname similarly. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, annual floods in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, th then there's issues of droughts in Dominica. We've had, that is set against the, the background of declining markets for agricultural produce as a consequence of the reduction in, in, in access and so on to, to the European markets occasioned by decisions of the World Trade Organization and so on. So food insecurity in, in, in the Caribbean is characterized by undernourishment and malnutrition. Whilst back, you know, 50 years ago, we had major issues with protein energy malnutrition. Right now we're having a different kind of, of, of um, nutritional issue in that really and truly the, the consumption of high, highly processed, uh, dense carbohydrate foods and so on is is, con is to the extent that we now have 8.1 million people and things who are undernourished, uh, who are vulnerable to the double burden of poor nutrition as well as overnutrition. Uh, food energy availability ex exceeds the recommended energy guidelines. So obesity and chronic non-communicable diseases 
are a major burden. burden. Um, the hypertension affects 26% um, of, of people in, in, in Barbados and elsewhere. And then we have a high food import bill in some part associated and thing with a high dependency upon tourism. And, but this high food import bill um, is not all pervasive in that we have Belize and Ghana and, and Haiti and uh, to, to some to some extent I think who have been able to, think, to reduce the food import bill. This is a view of, of some of the, the the and this is using the international coding system for for um, trade and it shows the the scope and the, 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 the quantity of and the, and the value of the, the foods that are imported in the region, like I said, and the total amount of thing is the high food import bill. So we see beverages, um, we see cereals uh, and, and grain, meat are high contributors to our food import bill. The food interest report card for the CARICOM countries is mixed. Um, the food and nutrition um, insecurity is mainly an access and utilization problem underscored by poverty, income inequality, and high prices. Uh, regional policies and program set policies. So we have, like I said, the regional policies such as the Caribbean community um, policy, the CARICOM agribusiness strategy, there have been hunger er eradication initiatives, school feeding programs, um, there have been programs and so on to help reduce the level of NCD burdens. And that has, as a consequence of, of some interface and thing between the agriculture and the health agendas. Um, there's also the governance mechanism in that a number of consortia have been established to help co-design and co-develop. So one such consortia deals with the issues of um, water, agriculture, health, um, as it relates and so on to the issues of childhood obesity. And then at the official level as well, we have a, a food and agricultural cluster, which is chaired by CARDI, which is, had, pulls all of these various entities together because the CARICOM is served by a number of regional institutions. Um, some of them would have been uh, listed like CARFA, uh, Sedima that deals with disaster management, SIGRI that deals with issues of, of renewable energy um, and, 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 so, and, and the like. So that together we have established a number of consortia to help to address the issues. And furthermore, um, we have, as a result of the, the efforts of the Conference of Heads of Governments, which is the, the most um, important policy body within CARICOM, we have established a resilience agenda that looks at all aspects of, of resilience, health, um, agriculture, disaster risk management, um, education, construction, um, and the like, so that the in 2018 at this conference in Jamaica, the heads of governments and thing agreed on a policy and so on for resilience. And each of the regional institutions, as well as national institutions, are mandated to make their contributions towards building a resilience agenda for for the Caribbean. As part of the helping to build a resilience agenda. Conference of Heads of Governments have also agreed that Dominica will be established as a center for agricultural resilience as an example for a small island developing state. So, and this is something which is continuing that we see contribution from the, the health interests as well as the agricultural interests across the region. Many countries and so on have used taxation as a measure to help to address the issues of, of um, health and ag agriculture, trying to promote healthy diets, we, we trying to promote salt reduction, um, trying to ensure that there are good practices in place at the level of the farm, at the level of manufacturing that redound to the benefit of the kinds of foods that, that we consume on a daily basis. And this is led by the Caribbean Agriculture and Food Safety Agency as well as support from CAFRA, who has a nutrition and um, public health and, and public and food safety agenda. They are supported by the 
meeting of annually, there's a meeting of the Caribbean vet, vets from all of the veterinarians from all of the countries of the Caribbean. In addition to the plant health directors, as well as the pesticide control boards to help to address the issues collectively as it relates and so on. And, and one of the things about the Caribbean is that, that all of these entities are at the table when these various issues are discussed. Climate financing, however, remains a challenge. Um, we, there've been some success with the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. Um, and they have been able to make payments out on things of those impacted by hurricanes and, and et cetera. Uh, recently, the, in the discussions, what has been happening, I think, is the trend to look at issues related to drought and issues related um, to matters of, of food safety to add to their portfolio and therefore provide some measure of sustainable uh, functioning of these various sectors when various disasters and so on are, 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 are faced. Um, in terms of region, recent regional agriculture development, the Conference of Heads of Government, when they met in earlier in 2020, they've agreed that they want to reduce the food import bill of the Caribbean by 25% by 2025. They've been able to get the private sector to, to, to lead in this regard. And only last week, when the Conference of Heads of Government met, the president of Ghana, who was the lead head for, for agriculture and food security, he did a presentation that was agreed to by the other, other, other members of the heads of government, which would not only look towards addressing the issue of reducing the food import bill by 25% by 2025, but at the same time, contributing towards helping to address, helping for Caribbean food and agriculture to help address the issues of, of health from chronic non communicable diseases. So a ministerial subcommittee has been established and we are now moving full steam ahead to help to address this matter. Uh, there are gonna be issues of dealing with trade, non-trade barriers, dealing with transportation, how do we move produce and so on from Belize down to, down to Suriname in order to help. How do we leverage the large tracts of land in Suriname and Ghana and Belize to help feed the Caribbean in a more sustainable way? Some of the work that Cardi has been doing is, um, you know, looking at tolerant varieties, um, germplasm conservation, um, looking at, you know, climate smart material, um, looking at introducing controlled environment agriculture as part of the solution, um, using satellite imagery and so on to have with damage assessment, providing quality planting material, and you working with the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology to help provide some climate services to assist the, the farming community. Um, so I thought I would go through what CARD is about, the challenges that we're facing, some of the responses by in the wider CARICOM context as well as CARDI, and I've also provided you with some, some literature um, to help to facilitate and continue your further embracing of this particular issue. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity. All the best. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. If you could stop sharing. I'm now very pleased to introduce Dr. Pablo Mendes Lazaro. Uh, Dr. Mendes Lazaro is currently Associate Professor uh, at the Department of Environmental Health at the University of Puerto Rico to the Gradius School of Public Health. He's an active member of the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council and is one of the six scientists um, nominated by the governor of Puerto Rico and confirmed by the Senate and the House of Puerto Rico to, work, to be on the executive committee of the Climate Change Adaptation Plan. He is also the PI and co-PI on a number of uh, NASA research projects looking at new technologies and ways that benefit um, all uh, segments of our socioeconomic and technology systems. Um, he's applying um, earth observing data and remote uh, sensing uh, to address the, the impact of climate change on uh, further population. So today, uh, Dr. Mendes Lazaro is going to talk about imminent risk due to interactions between public health, 
climate and environmental factors in Puerto Rico. Dr. Mendez. Hello, good afternoon, Martin. Can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna turn off my camera because I have my kids here. I'm doing homeschooling as well because of the COVID situation. So if you don't mind, I will turn off my camera and stay on, unless it's necessary. I will turn it on, okay? So thank you for inviting me and happy to be here and sharing with you um, with all of this um, other speakers. I have learned a lot and, and I think that um, it is very important for us talking about climate change and in the Caribbean region, which it could be identified as one of the most vulnerable region um, um, because of the different hazards and the interaction with um, social um, determinants of health. So, um, as is one mentioned by you know, the previous speakers, Maureen and, uh, and, and Barton, Barton as well, climate change is presenting uh, evolving challenges to human health and all of the distribution and diversity of living natural resources. And some of these changes are due to changing in temperature and weather patterns. And this have led to risk to exposure to, in some cases, to airborne allergens, vector-borne diseases, that is what mentioned by Maureen, for example, as malaria, dengue fever, chikungunya, um, and particularly in, in tropical regions, uh, as, as in the Caribbean, right? So there is also a, a major concern that climate change can also reintroduce some um, diseases into geographic areas where they have previously eradicated these diseases. Um, so that's why it, it, it's so important to continue working on this issue. Let me see if I can go to the next slide. Okay. So when we talk about climate change, uh, we think very quickly and, and the definition of on how the weather is manifesting itself, right? Severe droughts, extreme precipitation causing floods and extreme floods, coastal flooding, heat waves, extreme heat episodes, hurricanes and tornadoes. So all of these are the way on how all of the different variables on climate change, we can, we can express them in intensity, duration and frequency. For example, the heat wave, it, it can be analyzed in intensity because it can be very warm, very hot day for a couple of days, or it can be, or it can last for more than a three days, five days, five consecutive days. So duration is also another index for all these um, um, extreme weathers, right? In terms of droughts, droughts are very interesting for climate change because droughts are uh, an extreme event that the duration of the extreme event it can also cause the intensity of the and the severity of the drought, right? So it's very interesting to analyze all the different ex uh, extreme weather events. And I can think that I, most of them are present in the Caribbean. And it's what mentioned by Bart at, at the beginning. Um, the planet is warming worldwide and the Northern hemisphere is getting warmer faster than the, than the Southern hemisphere. That's because of so many things as, uh, more population in the northern hemisphere, more land surface, and more greenhouse gases in the northern hemisphere. But the second part of the second region of the of the globe that is warmer, that is warming the second and very fast, is the tropical areas. Since 2018, the NASA was telling us already and raising the flag that the, the, the tropical areas have the super greenhouse effects in the Earth's tropics. And why so? Because obviously one of the greenhouse gases that represent 80% in the atmosphere is water vapor. And as soon as the air surface temperature continue to rise, you will have more evaporation and evapotranspiration in the tropical forest, but also in the tropical oceans. So that means that could mean and more likely, right, to be more water vapor in the atmosphere. So causing more greenhouse gases. Um, and then um, uh, I was reading this new research manuscript that it just came out a couple of days ago it was published on March 8, 2021, to the right side of the panel, where you have seen that it was published on Nature, that they are confirming indeed that the second part of the globe that is getting fast, warming the faster are the tropical regions. So this is very important on how the dynamic of Earth is working, the atmospheric conditions, and how it can change in all of the different reactions um, affecting quality of life, well-being, and public health in vulnerable communities as are the islands in the Caribbean region. Something very important about climate change, and I think that most of you are gonna be talking about this, is that climate change is interacting with the social determinants of health. 
So I think that we have, we have improved in many ways in science, identifying trends, um, analyzing projections also, and all of the different climate variables. And I think that we have done, as scientists, a pretty well good job. And, and there is no doubt about it. But where we haven't improved that much is it's improving the quality of life that in somehow are limiting our adaptive capacity to respond, to be prepared, and to recover from those other extreme events, right? So these climate drivers are interacting directly with the environmental and institutional context, as it could be land use and ecosystem changes. For example, we live in the Caribbean. We might suffer hurricanes every, every year, but it does, it's not the same thing that is you, if you live in a flood prone area or if you don't live in a flood prone area. If you live in places susceptible to landslide or if you don't live in places susceptible to landslide, right? So land use is very important. Um, the other way is, the other thing is the other side of the, of the, of the diagram of the flow chart. So social and behavioral context. It's not the same thing if you're healthy, if you're young, if you do a sport and you are like 24, 30 years old and, and you need to confront a, a flood situation with your family that if you are elderly beyond 75 years old and you have diabetes and you are on a wheelchair and then all of a sudden also your house gets flooded. So all of the social and behavioral context is very important as well. And the income as well below, if you're living below the poverty level and so many other social determinants of health that are the conditions in where you live, you die, you grow and where you develop your, your, your lifestyle, okay? So that's very important in terms of climate change. So making a summary of what happened in Puerto Rico for the last five years, uh, as I mentioned, climate is not, it, it, it's not um, all alone by, by, by itself. And these hazards are not, uh, again, occurring by themselves without interacting with the social ecological um, systems. So back in 2017, for those of you that are not aware, um, Puerto Rico declared bankruptcy. And that means, so that means that for many decades before 2017, when you declare bankruptcy because you have been um, charging a lot of years without doing um, financial situation, very uh, healthy financial situations. So of all, only a couple of months after Puerto Rico declares bankruptcy, we suffer one of the most catastrophic hurricane season in the Caribbean that it was back in 2017. When in, in the matter of two weeks, we have Hurricane Herma and Hurricane Maria. Very powerful hurricane, category five and category four, both of them. And, and then, uh, so every six months or every one year, we are having in a very small island, in a very geographic, in, in an island with geographic isolation as a definition by an island, right? We also suffered um, uh, the political crisis. So everybody was focusing on the situation because of the corruption that we were struggling in the island. Six months after we had one of the, of the, with the earthquakes in the Southwest of the island of Puerto Rico. And only a couple of months after the earthquakes, we, in Puerto Rico, we received the first cases of COVID-19 in winter and spring 2020. And during the winter and, and the spring 2020, when we received the COVID-19, we were dealing with droughts as well. We were rationing water for some of the vulnerable communities. So they were dealing with COVID-19 after earthquakes and water rationing. And all of a sudden, also during the summer of 2020, we received one of the worst African dust event ever registered since we have satellite information that it lasts for two to three days with hazardous air quality conditions. That it means that it was unhealthy for most vulnerable population with respiratory problems. Um, so uh, this, is, this is what I'm talking when, um, uh, when we are about talking about climate change. This is not that um, we're gonna be um, warmer than, than, than ever or less water, but all of these extreme events can manifest one following another, or even during the same situation, during the same time period. And that is the complication. It's like a multi-hazard approach, right? Another you know, important thing of climate change is that uh, it has been recognized that climate change induced by human is because of the air pollution and greenhouse gases. So um, a couple of months ago, the, the, a couple of, of organizations and association of cardiologists, they called for urgent action to reduce air pollution. And it came out in the American College of Cardiology, um, recognizing that if we really wanna uh, reduce or mitigate or be better adapt to climate change, obviously we need to look to the 
temperature, and we need to look to the other social determinants of health, but we need to do something with energy. We need to do something with transportation. We need to do something with emissions. Uh, and because emissions are one of the, uh, of the, of the silent killers worldwide. So um, back in 2017, right after Yurek and Maria, our team was able to submit a proposal to, to NASA, apply um, uh, health, health and air quality um, program in the Earth Science Applied Science Division. And we obtained the grant. And we were focusing in, in African dust impacts on public health. And our goal was to develop early warning system for the Caribbean, mainly Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. And this is because when we talk about air pollution, we're talking about two different sources of air pollution. Well, major sources, natural sources of air pollution where you have allergens, like to be mold, pollen, aerosols, and then you have aerosols, right? And on the other components, you have those um, sources that are human induced because they come from human emissions, right? So there are different sources of air pollution, but we are focusing in this, in this area of natural sources of air pollution impacting public health. And that's another part of, of climate change as well. So we proposed back in 2018, 17, uh, to characterize the distribution and variability of African dust, and I will explain what is African dust right now, using Earth observation data. So we are working with satellite information a couple of them on different sensors to better understand the trajectory, the composition, the tra uh, and, 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 uh, and this, the disperse of these aerosols arriving to the Caribbean. So we have three different working groups. The first working group is mainly called Public Health and Wellbeing and Resilience, and it's focusing on analyzing the, um, have two different approaches, working with quali qualitative information with patients and medical doctors, and the other way is analyzing secondary data in terms of hospital admissions, mortality, and emergency room visits associated with African dust arrival to the Caribbean. The second working group is called Atmospheric Forcing and Air Quality, and it's responsible of characterizing this particle once they are arrived to the, to the Caribbean region. So this, this working group is focusing working on ground base stations, taking samples and analyzing the concentration, the dispersal and patterns of, uh, and the composition of, of this dust once it's arrived. And the third working group is, uh, is developing decision support tool where we're designing tools, um, this, literally visualization tools that are gonna be open to the public in order for them to have responsible information from scientists, from stakeholders and, and, and um, public health organizations in Puerto Rico. So we're analyzing environmental data set more than 137 for the Caribbean region. We are including the whole Caribbean, even though the early warning system is gonna be developed for Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. And, but we are including since satellite information is, allows you to obtain information for a wide region. We are including the full region of the Caribbean because the region of the Caribbean suffered the same Godzilla dust event. So whatever we found for Puerto Rico, it might be transferable for other islands. So it could be a benefit to the other islands as well. Um, so what is the African dust and its season in the Caribbean? These are mainly um, dust particles that are arriving from the other side of, of, the, of the Atlantic, mainly coming, we call it African dust because it's coming not only from the Sahara Desert, but it's also coming from the northern part of Sahel Desert. So there are two sources in the African continent um, that is um, providing these this aerosols um, to, the, to the world. And this particle affect climate, weather, an ecosystem, including coral reef, forest, but also human population. It can have a benefit as nutrient to ocean ecosystem and also terrestrial ecosystem, but it can have a negative impact on, on the population. And it can have quartz, calcite, hematite, sulfites, and others. It can have dust, sea salts, volcanic ashes. And so these are some things that are, in some cases, complicated to determine the composition of this dust cloud only using satellite information. So that's why it's so important to also use ground-based station to make a, the, the characterization of the composition of these clouds once they are right. They travel more than 5,000 kilometers over the Atlantic Ocean, from Africa to the Caribbean, to the south uh, of the United States, and in some cases also to the Gulf of Mexico. Those seasons in the Caribbean mainly occurs between May and September. So it's interacting it's, it's, it's during the summer season. So it's interacting with heat episodes as well. And the most intense months in Puerto Rico are between June and August. So our team is um, emphasizing in developing early warning system. So to develop early warning system, our team is using a human-centered design to integrate public health 
environmental science, climate and atmospheric science to increase the resilience of the community. So we're not only developing a tool, a scientific tool to be there out there in the, in the, on the internet, but we, we start a communication with the, with the end users, we start a communication with public health agencies, medical doctors, and patients in the qualitative uh, approach, but we're also working with the satellite information. I'm producing human-centered design, as I mentioned. Human-centered design, because human-centered design is, a, is, a, is an approach that is uh, a start with the people that is affected the most by the problem that you want to solve. So understanding the profile, the symptoms, and the public health um, problems with African dust, not only because the data is telling you that emergency room visits are increasing or mortality is increasing, but also because the patients are telling you what they are suffering, but also the medical doctors are telling you what they are seeing in their offices. So that's very important. So previous research on African dust and health, uh, many researchers are already uh, analyzing African dust. African dust is something that is not only impacting the Caribbean region, it's also impacting the Mediterranean. And so there is evidence that African dust is associated with respiratory conditions in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico, in Trinidad and Tobago, and in Grenada. These are very dust, very fine dust particles that it can go very deep into the respiratory system. In the case of Puerto Rico, we have found that indeed also um, um, African dust days are associated with an increase in relative risk mortality without flu. We eliminate flu from the databases because flu in Puerto Rico is associated with a seasonal uh, on winter mainly. And as I mentioned, during the winters, we don't receive in Puerto Rico African dust. Um, um, as I mentioned on, on the summer of 2020, we received one of the most catastrophic or hazardous condition of mega African dust event. And as you can see here, at least since 2013, that we have satellite information in the region, we, have, we are seeing that 2020 was by far uh, one of the, uh, of the most concentration and hazardous condition due to African dust. We did a very quick survey to, to indicate and to have more information about the impact of this because relying on emergency room visit in the real time is very, uh, it's not uncertainty in Puerto Rico, it's not clear. So we did a survey and nearly 90% of the participants and we received almost 1500 participants in less than seven days indicate that African does affected the health status and both responders and their family members and most of them with asthma uh, reported conditions. What we notice is that you know, when African dust arrived to the Caribbean and to Puerto Rico, we also are seeing an increase in PM 2.5. And there are a lot of bottom information that is associated in PM 2.5 with respiratory conditions and cardiovascular diseases. Um, from the qualitative approach, um, the, the physicians and the, and, the, and the patients are also telling us that um, they have a, a lot of concerns that, they, that the physicians know that the kinds of medicines that they need to provide in advance when, they're, when this uh, um, African dust is arriving to the Caribbean. And now the patients are more aware what they need to do when they hear from us or from the National Weather Service or from the public health agencies that a cloud is arriving to the region. Also, after the Godzilla dust event, we also take advantage of that. And we did a couple of webinars, a full week of webinars to alert the, the, the communities about this um, about this hazard in, in Puerto Rico, because 20 years ago, you would not hear anything about African dust impact in public health. So we did a full week of webinars where we reached over 400,000 people um, during the full week of webinars with different par uh, participants in both Spanish and English. So this is uh, uh, a better version of what we're doing for the Caribbean region with CARICUS, um, and designing the, the, the visualization tool, providing the most accurate information in real time for the people. And it's gonna be also providing suggestion and recommendation on how to protect yourself. Yes, also in, um, you will have information about with infographics on information on the trajectory and what is the African dust, um, and what is coming from, where are the seasonalities, but also the impacts and how to protect yourself. And also the Puerto Rico Department of Health is adopting our information and they are publishing their this information in their website. So it's already available for the people to, to look at it. Um, since Afri this African dust event, Godzilla dust event, arrived to Puerto Rico during the summer of 2020, just a couple of months after um, the, the first case of COVID-19, we were wondering how this interaction also um, could affect the severity of the symptoms 
in patients that were struggling to survive with COVID-19. Um, so we submitted another proposal to NASA and we were successful. And so now we are analyzing the interaction between the environmental conditions, COVID-19, and the aerosols um, that are coming from the other side of the Atlantic. Our, we want to know if, one, if the dispersed, if, if aerosols are also increasing the dispersal of the virus. And the second is that if the African dust, the presence of African dust can exacerbate the severity of the symptoms of the patients that are living with the COVID-19. So those are the main, the main questions that we want to, to answer uh, during this research. We started back in, in November, 2020. So we are literally working on it. So we are on a very early stage, um, but again, we have a lot of data sets and we are, we're working with the end user and the different organizations. And I think that by um, this summer, we're gonna have very interesting results on it. And that's it. This is, this is my, my presentation. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um... Dr. Mendes, and so now we have in the next 20 minutes, the opportunity to answer questions. Um, there have been a couple that came through and if everybody can turn on their cameras, I'm asking my, the panelists to turn on their cameras so that um, the audience can interact with us. Um, and so the first question is for Dr. Clark. Um, a question came in and asked, well, why in such a, Lush Island of uh, in the Caribbean, specifically Jamaica, um, is there a net import of foods? Well, there, there are a combination of factors. One is that you have a very high tourism population who have placed certain demands upon the food system, um, including issues of, 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 of safety and pesticide levels and uh, uh, also including issues of regularity of supply and, and, and those matters, which then, because most, most of those, most of those um, hotels, et cetera, when they open, they can't tell the, the people that, okay, well, we're waiting for produce to come from the small farmers down in, down in, um, in Portland. So that is, that, is one, this, that is one of the major issues. The other issue is, has been historical in that the region has been accustomed to producing for exports, sugar, banana, rice, citrus, cocoa, coffee, uh, with limited attention to the domestic space because the objective one thing was to earn foreign exchange. Of course, with the demise of those export markets as a consequence of the WTO ruling, there has not necessarily been that same focus on trying to meet domestic demand. It is only now that we begin to see some energy from the from the political directorate, um, some with some enabling policies, and that the private sector, who are accustomed to importing, are now saying, "Okay, that we want to participate in an effort to help to deal with the issues of of reducing food imports in the region." Thank you. And then there was a, a, another question, and uh, this one for Dr. Mendes. Um, why call it African dust? Why not call it Saharan dust? Or why not call it transatlantic dust to take away the stigma? Yeah, that's a pretty good question. Um, we have been discussing that uh, in many other panels as well and with other groups. And uh, to be honest, I don't know how to call it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we call it African dust. Why? Why not? Because it's coming mainly from the continent. It's coming in mainly from two different sources in the desert on the north side of the African continent. And that's it. And I, as I mentioned, it has a lot of benefit to other ecosystems. To marine ecosystems, it can have a bunch of different benefits. It's, a, it's providing nutrients also to the ocean. It's providing nutrients to the terrestrial forest, to the tropical forest in Brazil. So it's not an, a negative component. It's only a negative component to human health, but to other system, ecosystem on earth, it has benefits. So we cannot um, talk in a negative way about African dust, okay? And African dust, we can call it transatlantic dust if you want, but it, it will not tell you the, the source if you call it transatlantic um, dust, right? It will only know where is transportation is occurring, but you will not know the source. 
if you call it African dust, you will know that it's coming from Africa at least, okay? And, that's, and it's coming from Sahara and the Sahel Desert, both of them. And so there was a follow-up question and saying, well, how strong is our evidence that really it is that dust that impacts human health, whether it's cardiovascular or um, asthma? Yeah, the different pathway on how it's occurring. Um, there are many um, researchers doing um, those kind of analysis in Las Canarias, for example, in, in Spain. African dust is not only impacting the Caribbean region. It depends on the season. In some cases, during the winter and the spring, African dust is impacting the southern part of, of Europe. So there is a lot of literature also on how um, this African dust is affecting health in Italy, in Spain, and even in southern France. Um, yeah, and it's associated also with cardiovascular diseases in some, in some cases. And so we'll switch back to the issue of investment and investment of resources. Um, this is for all three of us. And what particularly um, are OAS and PAHO doing and how are they collaborating in addressing climate change in the Caribbean? So I'll begin and say that I'm aware that the Pan American Health Organization is working on surveillance systems <coughs> and adaptation. Um, and that it's funding individual countries to do adaptation assessment to strengthen their surveillance capacity. PAHO is also providing um, information and support to increase the, the, uh, the building of more smart hospitals. Um, but I want to also give um, uh, Barton the opportunity to talk about OAS and, and PAHO together as well as um, and Pablo. So, so Dr. Clark, any other information about what OAS and, and um, PAHO are doing together, particularly perhaps in the agricultural area? Thank you, because when it comes to, to agriculture and, and the food systems, we, in, we know that PAHO is, is supporting the, as you would have alluded to, the One Health approach, which includes not only health aspects, but also agriculture and climate change aspects. So we are familiar with that. Then, then there's the issue of the antimicrobial resistance, which has emerged in, in our food systems with respect and thing to livestock and livestock medication. That's another area of endeavor. Um, and food safety, um, there are significant investments and things where they're collaborating with the Caribbean Agriculture and Food Safety Agency. They're collaborating with the Caribbean Agency responsible for, for um, standards and quality, um, the, as well as the, the CARPA in addressing issues related and so on to, to um, pests and disease management related to the implementation of good agricultural practices and good manufacturing practices to assist with, with issues relating to how, how do we mitigate the impacts of, of these issues on food systems. Thank you. Now there were another set of questions that came. Um, one is, um, what really are we doing with uh, looking at or decreasing the carbon footprint uh, in the Caribbean? And, and how, what's the progress that we're making? And so, um, Dr. Mendez? Yeah, um, thank you, Maureen. That's a very interesting question. At least um, in, in Puerto Rico in 2019, the government passed a new law that forbidding the use and for all of the government agencies to buy new cars and new vehicles that are running with fossil fuels since 2020. So the law was signed and approved in 2019 and started forbidding all of the new vehicles since 2020. And the goal is to have all of the government vehicles um, at least hybrid or completely electric by 2028. So that is a very ambitious goal. And in terms of the, uh, and that's because of the new commission where we're working on, on the climate change adaptation. And so another goal is to have at least a reduction on, on clean energy of, of fossil fuels. Um, so because I saw that someone mentioned that obviously we are extremely dependent on fossil fuel in the Caribbean. And um, yes, that is, that's, a, that's a very, that's a handicap that we have. And in Puerto Rico, obviously that's, that's, a, that's a huge handicap, but we are trying to change it. And the new law is trying to, promote renewable energy and a transition by 2030 
and another transition to 2050. So we, we are supposed to have 100% on clean energy um, production in 2050 in Puerto Rico. And for 2028, all of the government vehicles, clean energy as well. And that's, that's good news. Um, and so all three of us um, it, from the Caribbean perspective mentioned the importance of engaging with health professionals, engaging with practitioners, engaging with communities um, to address uh, the area of climate and health um, that is so often forgotten. And those are the social determinants of health. Um, and so from whether it's from a respiratory perspective or from um, a food security perspective, um, I, I would love to for us to talk about that. Um, for vulnerable populations in public health, that's typically what we focus on. But because climate uh, and, and the impact of climate and climate change on human health is not very tangible, it, it, it's it's tangible for us and, and we see it, but, but not for the everyday person. And so if we, my, my uh, few point is, if we address the impact of climate on the most vulnerable population, we will be able to uh, counter the impact on everyone. And so, you know, Barton, your few point on that. We, we concur um, because for me, the, the manifestation, uh, we, we're now dealing with threats. So for example, as on COVID-19 um, and the issues of COVID-19. And, and we found that very early in the game, we had to go into the communities and uh, to find out how the average jaw is being impacted and so on by, by COVID-19. Um, and if we switch now to, to climate change, the same thing has happened in that there's there's been a lot of public education, public campaigns that have taken place and so on in the Caribbean trying to educate people. So on the one side, until you have policies that deal with um, you know investments in renewable energy, but on the other side, there's been a lot of public campaigns helping to sensitize persons and so on regarding the impacts of climate change and how that is impacting upon the food security the national security, the health, and so so that um, and, and I mean one of the I suppose one of the most engaging examples we've had is is, is out of the fishery sector. We have climate change and sea level rise. We have the issue of sargassum, the inundation in the region and thing of um sargassum sea which is a, is, a, is a fairly recent development. So the Caribbean. Is dealing with fisheries, carry fisheries management entity. They, in collaboration, and they're they got some support from the government of Japan, and they have embedded themselves and so on within the communities. Um, and they've been collaborating and thing with with, with a NGO, the can the, the 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 Canary, which is the the Caribbean. Um, it's an NGO, Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, and they have been working with the community, trying to understand what what are the impacts. As a consequence of the climate, as a consequence and so on of, of, of the livelihood changes, um, as a consequence of the health impacts that are occurring. So I agree that as we move forward, that we have to embrace all parties um, as it relates something to addressing these issues and so on. Of, of health. Thank you. And Pablo, I know that during um, after Hurricane Maria, um, the public health professionals, public health agencies, and the clinicians um, were key in engaging, particularly the communities in the rural areas. And so your feedback on that and how that has improved since Maria. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, after Hurricane Maria, uh, we, we created some um, public health brigades, not only visiting, uh, before Hurricane Maria, was Hurricane Irma, we created brigades to provide um, medical attendance and, and some other kind of brigades with supplies to the other Caribbean islands, including uh, the British Virgin Islands, US Virgin Islands, even St. Martin. 
uh, we were able to, to send uh, more than 15 trailers full of people and full of supplies to help um, the other um, communities. And then all of a sudden, we, we received Hurricane Maria. So we changed the strategy and we began working with the rural communities in Puerto Rico. And based on the information that we had before, we and the supplies and the access of resources, because I work at the University of Puerto Rico in medical science campus, we built this network of public health um, uh, professionals from nurses, social workers, uh, psychiatrists, and we were visiting mo most of the of the of the communities in Puerto Rico, providing this access because they were unable to find um, healthcare services. I just can give, give you an example. In one of the rural communities in Puerto Rico, where they have seven thousand people, they live in the central ridge of the mountains, and um, they are elderly and disemployed and unemployed rates very high. And this community, before Hurricane Maria, they needed to drive on the rural condition for more than one hour and a half to go to a health clinic, the closest health clinic in Puerto Rico. So it's a little island, so you can imagine. And that's very far, far, far. And these are elderly people. So you can imagine after Hurricane Maria, these people driving with landslides, with, with roadblocks, and with dire situation without any light. Um, so we um, create an alliance and we submit a couple of proposals with the community leaders and we were able to build for the first time in Puerto Rico, the first community health clinic free of charge for the communities. And it's providing for four years um, a system and they have a medical doctor free of charge for four years. On top of that, uh, with the community leaders also, they identified that they were needed. They just not only want to do a disease management program, what is this a clinic, but they wanted to be a prevention program. So in, in collaboration with the community and Heart to Heart International, they help us also to create a, a community health promoters program in that community. So we have two different approaches. One that is the clinic that is working with the disease and the other one that is working with on the prevention. For the long term, we want a, a more healthy community, a, a sustainable community. And so, I, and the third sector was a, was a, um, protagonists in all these issues because the government, um, both all government, uh, federal governments, as you may know, Puerto Rico is part of the United States since more than 100 years, but it's one of the most discriminated territories in the United States. So we are like a citizen of second class. <laughs> That's a reality. And everybody know, knew that after Hurricane Maria. So uh, the federal government denied declined uh, to build a health clinic in that community, but also the state government declined it. So it was the, the, the third sector to step forward and to provide all of the support to build this clinic um, uh, for these communities. So after the hurricane, as most of you know, both governments failed, the state government and the federal government in providing the response and the recovery that the people needed during that time in very dire situations. So uh, let's, yes, I've been very, very involved and very close to uh, what happened after Maria and in fact, the National Academies of Sciences devoted a complete um, report and assessment of um, assessing how to assess and how to count um, cases of morbidity and mortality associated with major disasters. All three of us brought also brought up um, the the worry about uh, the impact of on of climate change on the increase of on the frequency and the intensity of severe weather events. And so, um, Barton, um, your, um, you know, your viewpoint on how this, the increase in frequency and severity is impacting food security in the Caribbean. The, the because of the increase in severity and frequency, um, which means that, um, let, let me look, say, for example, at what happened in in Dominica um, a couple of years ago, or Bahamas for that matter, where systems come and they, they wipe out everything. Uh, trees, Dominica is very mountainous, very much a tree country. The trees were snapped in half and, and trees take, you know, 10, sometimes 15 years or whatever, or even less, some, I suppose less than that, to come into bearing. So one would well imagine and think that there's a, there's a for some households and think there's a loss, total loss and thing of, of, of the income from, from that source. And that in itself, I think has the impact upon health in that look, um, your immediate supply of fresh produce goes, and then you are then left from thing with um, imported canned stuff, which is not good for you from a, 
from a health perspective. So, and then you're, you're, your challenge to recover in a shot are, are gone. Uh, the state can't really help you because the state and so on is, is suffering and thing as a consequence of that. But on the other side, there, there is some hope in that one of the things that we've seen over the years is that the root crops, the yams and sweet potatoes and dashing and tanya, they withstand these very strong hurricane systems. So as part of the resilience agenda, we have been mandated to advance the development of sustainable production systems, climate smart systems for the root crops, given that they contribute to help reducing the burden of chronic non-communicable diseases because they, they be talking about you know, um, complex carbohydrates as opposed to what we're accustomed to eating. The, 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 that then gives us a supply on thing of, of, of fresh produce it gives the income some level of income security and things to the to the farming community, so that this is how we are proposing to go forward regarding the regarding this effort. And only recently we got some support from the Caribbean Development Bank to provide some resources to help with the development of sweet potato and sweet potato value chains. And so some of the work that we would have done, of course, as well too, would have included, you know, things like drought modeling and hurricane modeling and climate modeling around the, some of these particular root crops because the remit has been, this is part of our resilience agenda and therefore that's what we need to pursue. Thank you. And so we're ready to transition um, to, um, to, uh, to the next part of the session. And so in, in summary, um, the Caribbean is disproportionately impacted um, by by climate, by climate change, particularly from a human health perspective, but also from an ecosystem perspective. Secondly, uh, is that um, the impact and, and the changes in climate far away from the Caribbean region disproportionately impact um, the countries in the Caribbean because of their size, because of population, that uh, the Caribbean is already um, suffering on a triple burden of non-communicable disease, infectious disease, as well as infrastructure development. Um, and lastly, that there are opportunities actually that are currently um, active in the community, in the Caribbean and in Puerto Rico to address issues of um, food security, to address issues of availability of services, to address issues of community engagement and clinician education and awareness. The strategic imperative, the six um, that we mentioned before, are going to help us create a roadmap um, to address those issues. And so we're now going to transition from the Caribbean um, to the other part of the Americas, the North America, and then address some specific issues, beginning with um, the benefits um, of a low carbon future. We talked a bit about um, that in the, uh, in the Caribbean um, part of this session. And so it's my honor to introduce Dr. Jonathan Patz, the co-lead for this session. Um, Dr. Patz is professor and director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, he co-chairs and co-chaired the, the health report for the first congressionally mandated United uh, States National Assessment uh, on Climate Change. For, and for 15 years, he served the lead for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as we know it as IPCC, um, and the organization that, as, as we all know and remember, uh, shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, has over 100 peer-reviewed uh, publications and, 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 and studies, um, and is well known also in the teaching world um, related to climate change and public health. Dr. Petz will uh, today um, talk to us about the health benefits of, from a low carbon future. Um, thank you. And join me in welcoming Dr. Petz. Yeah. Maureen, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be going from the Caribbean region to north of the more uh, to the US and then broaden the discussion. So I'm going to share my screen here. And does that look okay to you? 
It's good. Um, good. Okay, great. So I'm going to quickly uh, review uh, the climate crisis, why it's a health crisis, but focus on health opportunities from climate action. And just a reminder that it's, it's just a, a, an honor and it's been a pleasure to co-lead this um, satellite session to CEGH uh, with my colleague, uh, Professor and Dean Maureen Litzfeld. Uh, so this is a collaboration between the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, University of Pittsburgh and Tulane University. So um, I, I need not show you this, but this is just a quick reminder uh, that if you look at measured temperatures across the Northern hemisphere, it really is getting warmer, especially look at those extremely hot days on the right, which are dangerous. In North America, this is uh, from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences last year, uh, pointing out how hot it really could be. You know, we're talking about Maricopa County, Arizona, six months with temperatures above 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And our group has modeled um, cities east of the Mississippi River. And if you look at this graph, right now there are 13 days, this is New York City, 13 days that are 90 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter. But by mid-century, that 13 days of extremely hot temperature could triple by mid-century. 39 days, and this held up for most all cities east of the Mississippi. For cities in Texas, we're talking about 100 degree days, a doubling in the number of 100 degree days in, in big cities in Texas. And we think about humidity and temperature together. We all know about the heat index. And this is, you can see, you know, as the temperature goes up, the heat index goes up as the humidity rises. And if you get into this black zone, we are off the charts. Uh, as far as heat index. Heat index is important for health because we cool our bodies from, by pumping blood to our skin, the largest organ in the body. And uh, by sweating, we have evaporative cooling. Well, if it's humid and the air has lots of humidity and, and water vapor, it can't, you can't evaporate very well. So you, you get less cooling effect. So that's why when it's humid, it's more dangerous. So this is from a study from the Union of Concerned Scientists released just about two or three years ago. And they, on the left here, these bar graphs are showing the heat index. Uh, yellow is a uh, heat index of 90 degrees, orange, 100 degrees, red, 105 degrees heat index, and black is off the charts. And if we don't do anything, we're gonna hit temperatures so that in, in the United States, almost the entire population, you know, upwards of 300 million people will be exposed to that type of you know, nine, 90 uh, degrees Fahrenheit heat index. And over a million people will see heat indexes off the charts. So this is pretty extreme. But just a quick reminder of the physical attributes of climate change, it's more than just temperature, it's temperature, sea level rise, uh, from thermal expansion of salt water, as well as land-based glaciers sliding the oceans. Uh, and as we know so well, extreme to the water cycle. So we'll see more droughts, floods, and fires. And as Maureen pointed out in the beginning, you know, there, is, there are these, all these different pathways, exposure pathways, and these health outcomes that are climate sensitive um, that we're really worried about. This graph here, this uh, slide, is a reason why I've dedicated my career to this problem. I view the climate, cr climate crisis as our largest public health crisis of our times. And we're seeing this, of course, you know, across uh, North America. This is this past year, fires, unprecedented fire season, uh, new studies coming out showing that wildfires, the smoke from wildfires is more dangerous and more hazardous than we realize. So um, this is really what we're seeing this. You know, we're not waiting for the future, it's, it's here. Another air issue is uh, biologics uh, in the air, uh, aeroallergens. Um, unfortunately, there are some plant species that will benefit. While many crops are forecasted to decline and we're gonna have problems uh, as our speakers already talked about food issues, but there are a couple of plants that will do really well with higher temperatures 
and more CO2 in the atmosphere. Study, uh, greenhouse studies of poison ivy uh, shows poison ivy will just do wonderfully with uh, more CO2. And also ragweed pollen. And there's studies uh, across the country showing that ragweed pollen season is lengthening, uh, and especially at higher latitudes. In my state of Wisconsin, we have a, a ragweed pollen season that's two, almost two weeks longer than it was uh, pre-industrial time. And of course, that's a problem for people with asthma. Now, of course, the other side of the hydrologic cycle uh, is extremes in rainfall and flooding. Um, looking at North America, you can see uh, everything with the black hash marks are statistically significant increases in precipitation that we've seen um, in, in the last few decades. That's a problem, especially for my region. My state of Wisconsin is uh, highlighted there. Uh, and right next door is the city of Chicago. Uh, we studied the rainfall impact uh, with climate change and found that the extremes of rainfall and, and runoff um, will make, make it so that um, sewage systems cannot handle it. And right now there are lots of, there's combined sewage overflows in the United States right now where over a trillion gallons of contaminated stormwater overflows into surface uh, water, into lakes and streams every year. And with climate change, that's going to increase. And so we're really worried. Uh, we see a doubling in the risk of these combined sewage overflow events for a place like Chicago. Now, of course, when we think about floods, we think about water contamination. But guess what shows up in the emergency room? It wasn't. Uh, diarrheal disease and issues with floods. It was, it was asthma from people going back into their homes after the floods. So this is a, a huge issue, especially in low-income housing or people that live in floodplains. And these infrequent events, like the 100-year flood is becoming the 15-year flood. And these repeated, you know, I, I think a previous speaker talked about an increase in the frequency of extreme events really, really concerning for health. Some people argue that the largest threat from climate change could be the smallest, meaning these uh, small insects that carry disease that are highly sensitive to small changes in temperature and humidity. So for example, this uh, mosquito species, Aedes aegypti, that carries yellow fever, dengue fever, and Zika virus, um, that mosquito's body temperature is the same temperature as the air around her because she's a cold-blooded insect as opposed to us mammals that are warm-blooded. So air, so temperature has a lot to do with transmission dynamics. And when Zika erupted in the winter of 2015 and 2016, uh, I had uh, people in our uh, Center for Climatic Research at the university um, look at the temperatures during that El Nino event and as that El Nino event was, was for, forming, everything in red is more, than a two, is more than two standard deviations warmer than a constructed 60 year average temperature. So we had very hot temperatures right before Zika emerged. So there was a huge uh, dengue epidemic and Zika because it's, Zika is the same family as dengue, same, carried by the same mosquito. Um, of course, international travel was probably um, a precursor. Uh, it's, uh, Zika was in Polynesia and maybe from the World Cup or from canoe races, uh, infected people brought the, the virus into Brazil. Um, but we think that temperature had a lot to do with it. And one thing about Zika compared to dengue that surprised me uh, was that, um, oh, hang on just one second. Um, we weren't surprised because we were scooped by these uh, scientists that found that, in fact, the ability of that mosquito to transmit virus was at its highest level in the last 60 years. So the ability of Aedes aegypti mosquito to transmit disease uh, because it's so sensitive to temperature was in fact um, the highest level it had ever been. And what surprised me was the laboratory studies that showed that the Thermal optimum for Zika transmission is actually five degrees centigrade warmer than dengue. 
I had been telling people Zika will behave just like dengue. But th these lab studies show that maybe that extreme El Nino and very hot temperatures could have had a, a major role in having Zika uh, take, take hold and, and spread. Okay, so now I wanna shift gears and talk about a low carbon economy and why I think that combating climate change could actually be free. And it's, it's from the health frame why climate action could be free and incredible benefits. And I've been writing about this for a while. Uh, challenges and opportunities of climate change. Solving the global climate crisis could be the greatest health opportunity of our times. And a low carbon future could improve global health and achieve economic benefits. So if we look at the sources of greenhouse gas emissions, this is how it's broken up. And I'll just say that, um, you know, if you just look to the right, uh, electricity, food systems, and transportation, I've been focusing, I'm gonna focus just on those three big sectors, which are more than, uh, or about two thirds of the emissions. And this is what is just, this is, you know, so important for communicating because climate change is a health crisis and it's a health emergency and it's coming fast. It's actually here. But for people that don't even, you know, that don't buy the climate change science, which they should, but if they don't, look what happens just from air pollution, from burning fossil fuels. This is irregardless of climate change. Burning fossil fuels, and this, and Pablo already talked about this, you know, the emissions from burning fossil fuels kill people. Um, this is a new estimate from um, a, a broader uh, meta-analysis with new data coming in that 8.7 million premature deaths happen every year from burning fossil fuels. And the food sector, <clears throat> we have a very unsustainable diet, especially um, high meat consumption. And if we were to get to <clears throat> what, according to the, the Lancet Commission, the Eat Lancet Commission report that came out two years ago, they recommend um, the universal healthy reference diet that all of you know about. You know, it's very little red meat, more fruits and vegetables, nuts. You, you know the diet, right? But if we were to get away from a high meat diet um, and get to the reference diet, that could save 11 million premature deaths. And the last sector I'll talk about is transportation. Uh, because we over rely on private motorized vehicles, um, it's estimated that from sedentary lifestyle, almost 4 million premature deaths happen every year. So if you add up those numbers, guess what? Those numbers add up to nearly half of all premature deaths that happen every year worldwide. So this is a huge deal and a golden opportunity. Now, Maureen talked uh, earlier about the, the front and the ecosystem destruction and, and also climate change that are moving, uh, forcing bat migrations and, and uh, changes in the reservoir host of viruses. You know, so the idea of environmental determinants at the front end of the current pandemic. But look at, um, look at the other side of this pandemic. This pandemic has caused us to shutter the global economy and reduce fossil fuel emissions. And look what we see, you know, estimates from this reduction in fossil fuel burning and pollution just over two months uh, say, save 24,000 lives in China and more than 2,000 lives in Europe. So we know that air pollution is dangerous, but this is just a perfect example. And what is clearer than this before, after pandemic um, of looking at air quality in a polluted city like New Delhi? And it's, you know, we need to ask ourselves this obvious question, you know, at this time, do we really want to uncork the current fossil fuel economy and go back to that. Or like the UN is talking about and the Biden administration is talking about, build back better for a clean energy economy where everyone prospers. And as this uh, IPCC report that was called for after the Paris 2015, the Paris summit, 
you know, the climate scientists were asked, what would it take to stabilize temperature at one and a half degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels? Sorry guys, but the bad news is that the answer was we have to cut emissions by 45% in the next nine years. That is an emergency. That's really fast. And it's why the youth are protesting and the movements. This is, you know, this is one of these, if not now, when? This is, this is now a crisis and emergency. And again, for skeptics that, that don't buy climate change, you know, just look at these numbers, you know, coal-fired power plants kill people every year in our country. You know, on you know, estimates between 60 and 80,000 deaths every year just in the United States. We did an experiment in our state of Wisconsin and have this scenario of a clean power, you know, clean energy, mostly solar and wind, but a, a mixture. Look at the health benefits, you know, all these different benefits from cleaner air quality. And that reduction of 1,900 lives saved, that reduction of death, 1,900 premature deaths avoided, equates to $21 billion every year in air pollution health savings, especially from, you know, from PM 2.5 and from ozone, mostly from premature deaths and uh, avoided hospitalization. So this is a golden opportunity. And I'll just quickly go worldwide, you know, estimates of, getting the clean energy, it, it may cost on average $30 investment for every ton of CO2 that you want to avoid emitting. But every time you don't burn coal and you avoid emitting that ton of CO2, you also don't emit the regular air pollutants that kill people. You know, this is just looking at reduction in PM 2.5. You know, I asked policymakers, which number is bigger? You know, the investment for the clean energy or the savings in the health benefits. And, um, but we have to, you know, now question, it may be a lot cheaper than $30. Look at the price of solar energy. It's dropped 99% in the last few decades. And get this, two years ago, the International Renewable Energy Agency, for the first time ever in history, found that if you remove all energy subsidies for any type of energy, that the cheapest way to generate electricity is with renewables and batteries. So we're not waiting for a miracle. There's no, absolutely no reason to just switch over as fast as possible. And I'll wrap up with this two quick slides on uh, food and transportation, the food sector. Uh, this is a monumental new report, the EAT Lancet Commission on Sustainable Food Systems. I just want to cut to the chase and so show you a key figure. Um, this is their, their universal healthy diet that all of us know, more fruits and vegetables, very little red meat. Everything to the right of this dotted line is in excess and we should do without it. You know, cut way back in these things. And if we did that, if we got to this universal healthy diet, I'll make this complicated slide simple and say if we got to that, you know, we would see we we'd see 11 million premature deaths avoided every year and tremendously um, in, improvement for environmental impact. And lastly, the transportation sector, um, U.S. cities with the highest rate of walking and cycling have uh, lower obesity rates, lower diabetes rates, and of course, exercise is not is more than just burning calories. Uh, pumping, uh, contracting muscles are chemical factories for um, anti-cancer agents and anti-heart disease agents. So, you know, exercise is great. So we wanna get to active travel and design cities for people rather than just for automobiles. And so it's really a push for active travel and better transit systems. So I'll end by, asking this question, you know, why don't we treat climate change with the intensity that we are treating infectious disease like COVID? Because after all, climate change is a global health crisis. And with that, I encourage you to, you know, spread the message that climate change is a health crisis with health risk, but climate action offers huge opportunities. And the first thing to do is spread this message. I have a 19-minute a version 
of this talk. You just Google my name and TEDx uh, and spread the word and you can also follow me with that. I, I thank you very much and I'll stop my screen share for the next speaker. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, if we're not if we weren't convinced yet, your presentation truly brings it home. Um, and I can't wait to get into the Q&A section. But before that, we have three fantastic speakers lined up. The next speaker is Dr. Madeline Finkel. Um, Dr. Finkel is Professor of Population Health Sciences and the Director of the Office of Global Health Education at the Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City, where she also is the curriculum leader in the medical school. Um, she focuses on women's health issues, including in LMICs. Um, and um, her, one of her areas of expertise is um, climate change and the impact on health and the environment. Um, an author of more than 15 books um, and a seminar series recently on climate and health at the medical college. Today, Dr. Finkel will focus on the health effects of fracking. Dr. Finkel. Thank you very much, Maureen, and thank you, Jonathan, for really such a wonderful segue into what I'm going to be talking about. Um, all of the uh, previous talks have, have, uh, have shown that we, we definitely have a problem uh, trying to address climate change, and, and certainly the impact of climate change on health is, is multifactorial. Addressing how we can mitigate adverse health requires a multi-pronged approach. I think the previous speakers tried to make that clear. And it also requires an understanding of the factors that are contributing to changes in health. And certainly fossil fuels are a major contributor to both the climate change that we're witnessing as well as to adverse health. And so what I'm going to try and do in a rather condensed form is to give an overview of the impact of unconventional gas and oil development, informally called fracking, and its effect on climate and health. And what I want to do is go over a little bit about what fracking is and then present uh, some of the, the adverse health effects of it. What this process does um, is, is basically you are injecting millions of gallons of water combined with a mixture of chemicals, many of which are toxic, and propens, which are usually sand and silica. And by the way, Jonathan, a lot of the uh, sand and silica comes from your home state of Wisconsin. These fluids are then injected under high pressure into the drilled well. And with this process, trapped gas is then released along with the flowback uh, fluids consisting of the water and the chemicals that were used in the, in the uh, process. What we see is a huge pressure cooker of organics and inorganics. And even if every single compound pumped into the well is harmless by itself, which it isn't, um, the pressure would create hundreds if not thousands of different compounds uh, that are potentially highly toxic. The process releases toxic and cancer-causing chemicals such as benzene, toluene, xylene, these are the BTEX uh, uh, chemicals, methylene chloride, and other health hazardous air, air pollutants. So these pollutants are released from a number of different sources, including well blowbacks, flaring of the wells, and well venting. Clearly then, exposure to these hazardous materials can occur many different pathways, including breathing the polluted air, drinking, bathing, or cooking with contaminated water, eating food grown in contaminated soil, and especially vulnerable populations, young children, pregnant women, the elderly, and those with pre-existing conditions, mostly respiratory diseases, asthma, et cetera, they are most at risk. It's not that the healthy people are, you know, not at risk, we are, but we have, you know, those with, you know, more vulnerability, if you will, who are at risk. So we have this processing, this process here. Now the gas produ production through fracking has clearly serious uh, impacts, negative impacts on climate through the release of methane. 
And methane, as we all know, is a potent greenhouse gas that leaks from production sites, the well here. This clearly has also implications for achieving a carbon-free future. So Jonathan explained how we might want to get to a carbon neutral uh, environment here. We need to focus on methane. And it's long been assumed that natural gas, because it burns more cleanly than coal or oil, is climate friendly. But we now know through emerging science that this is not the case necessarily. Methane is emitted throughout the oil and gas development process. The gas is potent, trapping heat at roughly 84 times the rate of carbon dioxide. And we estimate that around 25% of the current global warming traces to methane. We know that methane is leaked deliberately, on purpose, through burn-off, through the burn-off at the well. And we know also that it leaks. Methane leaks uh, are, are, are polluting our air. And it turns out there was a recent spike in global methane levels. And we saw this through satellite pictures. And this was, of course, putting the climate uh, uh, targets at risk. And it turned out that this leak, these mysterious spikes of methane, were coming from US oil and gas fracking. And I would expect also from China, which is a very big uh, uh, fracking country. So aside from the negative impact on the warming of the planet, methane interacts with sunlight, right? And so we get uh, this tropospheric ozone, ozone, which is a strong respiratory irritant and it's associated with increased morbidity and mortality. So what do we do about this? This is, the, this is reality, this is the situation. Currently fracking is banned in many European countries and other countries have temporarily halted uh, the drilling through uh, hydraulic fracturing. But the production method is widely used still today in Canada, in China, in Argentina, and certainly in the United States. So let, let's just focus on the United States for, for a moment here. It's estimated that about 18 million people in the United States live within one mile of an active oil and natural gas well. And many more millions work or go to school or live within five miles of an active well. So we've studied this over the past 20 years or so. And I just want to clarify that, the, that hydraulic fracturing is not new per se. This has been going on for decades, particularly in the South Texas, Louisiana. But what we've seen and has been a game changer is these uh, the unconventional gas and oil development uh, procedures using uh, uh, different mechanisms, as I showed you in the past slide, where you're fracturing right the shale so that the gas can come up. That that's different. All right. So we have tens of millions of people living within close proximity to wells. And what we have also seen is that certain states are, are, are heavily uh, fracked, if you will. Colorado, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Kansas, believe it or not, Kansas. So we now have a better idea of the potential harm to human health, as well as to the environment, based on about 20, 25 years of experience witnessing what's happening in these key areas. Certainly in Pennsylvania, the Marcella Shell is very famous now um, for you know, being a heavily fracked area. In neighboring New York, New York State, uh, Governor Cuomo instituted a permanent state ban on fracking. So this actually presents a very nice you know, natural study. You have neighboring counties on, on, on the border between New York and Pennsylvania, some with a lot of uh, oil and gas exploration going on through fracking and other areas in the new north, uh, in New York, not. So we can actually take a look to see what effect this procedure, this process is having 
on health and well-being of the population. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit, if you don't mind. Of the few studies that have looked at chemical cocktails used in this whole process, we've identified chemicals um, that, that, that are known to cause cancers, okay? We know that they cause mutations. We know they cause diseases of the nervous, the immune, the reproductive, and the endocrine systems. We also have seen a rise in kidney, gastrointestinal, liver, heart, and skin diseases among people living in somewhat close proximity to uh, active wells. We've seen an increase in cancers, particularly bladder, thyroid, leukemia, adult and child, and childhood non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, also in people living within clo close proximity to these wells. Um, is this coincidental? Is this directly related to what's going on with, uh, you know, the well um, process, the fracking? Well, we have to take a closer look, and it's not, it's not an easy question to answer. A lot of the health effects are short-term exposures to the pollutants. People will complain of headaches, of coughing, nausea, nosebleeds skin and eye irritation, dizziness, shortness of breath. These are anecdotal. They're based on people telling us that, you know, once they started drilling, once they started, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the drilling for oil and gas, I, I got these conditions. Coincidental? Maybe, maybe not. We need to empirically study all this. We also have seen in the recent literature an association between pregnant women living in close proximity to fracking sites and giving birth to low birth weight babies. A recent study just showed that there was an elevated risk of heart failure among those living near fracking sites. More alarming to me is what happens going forward? What about the long-term effects? And most worrisome to me at least, is what's happening with endocrine disrupting chemicals. These are substances in the environment, the air, soil, water supply, in food sources, personal care products. They're manufactured products that interfere with the normal functioning of the endocrine system. And we've started to see over the last 10, 15 years, the, the danger, if you will, the risk of these endocrine disrupting chemicals having effect on individuals in the endocrine systems. And the, these disruptors are affecting hormone signaling. And what, what effect will this have going forward in terms, of, uh, in terms of reproduction, in terms of how the endocrine system operates and works in a not so healthy environment now? So we need to know much more about what the effect fracking is having, particularly on endocrine disruption. Now, I, I, I say this with a little bit of skepticism because I'm an epidemiologist by training. And, and this may be a fact. I'm not saying that, that fracking is perfectly healthy and fine for you, or quite the opposite. But what we need to understand is to take into account confounding factors. And, and if we don't do that, then we're not getting the right story, okay? Lifestyle behavior factors, smoking, uh, occupational factors. Where do you work? Do you work in a coal mine? Do you work in an industry that's heavily uh, polluted and so forth? So what we've seen over the recent years, within the last 10 years, I would say, is numerous studies coming out um, much better than the ones done previously, trying to analytically assess the, the risks uh, associated with, with fracking. And there was a compendium published in 2019 looking at 1,500 rigorous scientific studies, looking at the risks of fracking. And it found a tremendous increase in the evidence of harm. It, it, it's a for real. To what extent, we still need to have better data. The reports are, are accumulating. 
they're showing what the potential for harm is in the short term. We still don't know what the long term effect is, but this is going to vary by a lot of different factors. It's going to vary by your proximity to the well, to the active well, the length of time of exposure. You know, you can't move in within a couple of months and then all of a sudden say, you know, I'm sick because of fracking. Um, usually it takes time, particularly with cancers, uh, for diseases to uh, develop. And also the route of exposure. Is it from breathing the air? Is it from drinking the water? Is it from eating contaminated food grown? It's not with the food in contaminated soil. You know, these factors have to be taken into account to ex understand the extent of the relationship of health, health outcomes and fracking. And we do this epidemiologically by using Sir Bradford Hill's criteria, which I'm putting up here. It, it's somewhat self-explanatory and has uh, withstood the test of time. He built this criteria in the 1960s. And we know that epidemiology can rarely show 100% causality between risk exposure and disease. We know that. But what we want to look is for the strength of association. You know, what is, what would be causing an increase in the risk of disease X? Now, certainly we know that diseases have several different risk factors. Uh, you know, there, there, there's, uh, you know, one disease may have several different risk factors. Uh, smoking contributes a lot to diseases and so forth. You know, what confounding factors might explain what we're seeing among people living in proximity to, to well sites. And we need to assess how strong the association is. What other factors could contribute to the symptoms, to the diseases? And also we have to understand that ecological studies, descriptive studies cannot determine causality. You cannot link exposure to risk factors to disease through these kind of studies. What we need to do is have many more analytic studies, retrospective case control studies, cohort studies, and we need to take into account the pitfalls of causality, taking into account bias, taking into account confounding that might be built into a study and distort the findings, if you will. So we need to understand, do the results reveal a true association between the exposure and the risk factor to the agent in the disease? And if so, to what extent? What sources of bias, and bias is error, could have contributed to the relationship? And if the agent is associated with the disease, is the relationship you know, causal? What's the strength of association? We need to understand that. And we also need to understand how the study was designed. Is the study design appropriate to answer the research question and, and test the hypothesis? Who's the target population? How were the target population, the subjects, the participants recruited? And how representative are they to the general population? I'm talking here about generalizability. What was their sampling techniques? And are there sufficient number of people in the study? And this is of course an issue of statistical power. So what we need to do before we can, you know, state with certainty that, that there, there is, you know, a, a very real risk of, of becoming ill because you're living near a fracking well site, but for that fracking, you know, well site you wouldn't have gotten sick. What we need to know is, you know, what's going on. Now, these studies raise red flags. They warn of higher than expected morbidity and mortality. We're seeing that in study after study. And this should provide the impetus for, you know, further research, but also serve as a warning to the industry, to the oil and gas industry, that your process, what you're doing, is jeopardizing the health and well-being of people either working in the industry or living near your, your well sites. So all evidence shows 
clearly that fracking is not good for climate control. That, that's clear. We've seen that, uh, you know, particularly with methane. It's not good for the environment. The, the, the construction of the well pad, the construction of the pipe, pipelines, construction of uh, compressor stations, all terrible for the environment. And we know that natural gas is not necessarily a good replacement for, for coal and oil. Uh, even though it does burn cleaner, it's predominantly methane. Natural gas is methane. And as I said before, climate, uh, sorry, methane is a climate killer. So while the epidemiologic studies point to a very worrisome situation regarding health and well being, we still need to know more about the long term effects of exposure to the byproducts of fracking. And certainly in order to meet the Paris Agreement's goal to limit global temperature rise below 22 degrees uh, Celsius above pre-industrial uh, levels, and even trying to limit temperature increases further to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to address the factors that are impeding this. And fracking certainly is a major contributor to greenhouse gases and global warming. So what we need to do is as we try to attain a carbon neutral uh, environment, and we heard about what's happening in Puerto Rico, and we heard about what's happening a little bit in the United States, uh, we need to bring fracking into the conversation and then try to not shut down the whole oil and gas industry, we're not gonna do that, but at least try and make that industry a little bit safer for those who work in it and those who live near the, the, the wells uh, that are, are producing the oil and the, and the natural gas. So in a very brief 15, 20 minute uh, talk, I've hopefully laid out some of the issues and hopefully raised more questions than we have answers for. We, we definitely know that these uh, uh, issues are, are, are apparent through observational studies, through anecdotal uh, reporting, but we do need to do more analytic studies to get a true assessment of, of how dangerous, uh, you know, tracking is to human health. So thank you very much for your attention, and I will stop sharing my slides. Thank you much. Um, and so we face many challenges, as you've heard from the different speakers, but one of the biggest challenges we face is how to convince people that this is um, a major uh, health threat. And so to help us do that is Dr. Edward Maybach. Um, Ed is the professor at the George Mason University, and he works on global health and climate communication. Um, he's been doing this since 2010. He's been a distinguished professor of communication and the director um, of the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason. Um, between 2011 and 2014, um, he co-chaired the engagement and communication work working group of the National Climate Assessment Development and Advisory Committee. Um, today, Dr. Uh, Maybach is going to share with us um, how we address the climate crisis and health um, through effective messaging. Dr. Maybach. Thank you, Maureen. Um, are you able to see my slides? Yes. Excellent. Okay, greetings, everybody. Thank you for uh, spending the afternoon with me and uh, delighted to be invited to spend the afternoon with you. So I, I, the bad news is I'm not gonna actually give you the messaging that will allow you to do your job better, but what I'm gonna try to do is, is share with you the way I think about how to develop effective messaging based on, um, based on the evidence, based on what we know about uh, from communication science, from, from psychology, et cetera. Um, and before I dive into that though, I wanna start with two thoughts. One, one comes from Albert Einstein actually not normally known as a communication scientist, but he said that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. While he was talking about theoretical physics, that absolutely is some of the best advice you could ever get um, on, on how to make your communication effective. Then the other thought I wanna share before I dive in any deeper is the notion that um, 
even if you're trying to change the conditions in your country or your city, your, your region, your country, maybe the world, um, I want you to, to reflect on the fact that your target audience may be a lot smaller than you appreciate. Um, if you're trying to influence an important policy decision, uh, in the case of the United States, I, I don't have to reach all 310 or 320 Americans. I, I really might only need to reach one person. That might be the president, it might be the head of our, our uh, the speaker of our, our uh, house or the head of our Senate. Um, but really our target audience is often much smaller than we think, which really helps to shrink the sort of the challenge inherent in thinking about how, in developing effective communication. Because if you realize you're really trying to only target and influence the decisions of a couple of people, it, it makes your task much easier. So we're all public health people here. Um, and I, you know, we're all deeply steeped. All, all of the speakers who've spoken before me have talked about the social determinants of health. This is fundamental to the way we public health people think about population health and what are the drivers of health. But for me, almost 15 years ago now, I finally got it through my thick head um, that a stable climate is the most fundamental determinant of health. And literally when uh, that, that, uh, that realization, that epiphany dawned on me, it, it helped me realize that everything I'd been working on is that it was all important. Um, but the thing that I had to start working on and would be working on for the rest of my, my professional life really was to, to address the conditions that were leading to destabilization of, of our climate. Because if, if, we, if we fundamentally destabilize our climate, we're fundamentally undermining the, the conditions by which people can live happy, healthy, fulfilling lives. I have, um, this is a shout out to our next speaker, Jenny Miller, who's the executive director of the, the climate and, uh, Global Climate and Health Alliance. Um, this is a, one of her mem from one of her members, the Climate and Health Alliance in Australia. Um, and the, the message here is a simple, clear message. Climate change is a health emergency. You heard John Patz use this message as well. It's a really revolutionary message. It's beautiful in its simplicity, but it's important in refocusing an issue that not every person in the world has heard of, really, when the, the surveys show that maybe only two out of three people in the world actually know the terms global warming or climate change in their language, um, even though many more recognize that the symptoms, the, the consequences of global warming or climate change in their communities. Um, but most people, certainly most Americans, tend to think of it as a threat to plants, penguins, and or polar bears. And that's not accidental. The way that um, we communicate and have communicated about climate change here in the US over the past many decades typically focuses on polar bears. So for the archetypal image in people's heads, people's mental models, if you will, to be a polar bear, it's not coincidental, but it's not helpful. Um, much more helpful is to make human health, people's health, the health of uh, our friends and family, the health of our neighbors to be central in our understanding, our mental models of climate change. So this whole notion of reframing climate change as a human health issue, and specifically as a health emergency to emphasize the urgency in the situation is really fundamentally important. Now in, in 2015 in Paris, the, the Paris Climate Agreement was clearly a, a victory for the planet. Um, what, uh, the, the white words there for our health um, I actually typed those into that image myself. Um, that wasn't part of the messaging. Um, it should have been then. It is increasingly becoming part of the messaging out of the, uh, the UN climate change, uh, the UNFCC process and, and the Paris Climate Agreement process. And that's really good. And coming back to the notion of simplicity being a good thing, the notion of having a global goal of limiting warming to no more than two degrees, that's really helpful. But coming back to Einstein's point, we can't simplify, uh, we want to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. Turns out that the two degrees was an oversimplification because the, um, the IPCC was asked to, to review the evidence about the, on the question, is two degrees of warming safe? And they came back to us with the answer, no, not safe. Actually, the difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and two degrees of warming is really deeply consequential in terms of further impacts that will undermine health and well-being. 
at the end of this year or towards the end of this year, COP26 in Glasgow. This is, a, a, this is sort of the world's next best opportunity to try to um, increase our ambitions, increase our commitments to the uh, achieving the goal, the standing goal of the Paris Climate Agreement, holding warming to no more than two degrees. Ideally, they would be increasing uh, their, not only their commitments, but they would be ratcheting down the goal to limiting warming to no more than 1.5 degrees, because that really is the goal that is um, consistent with human health, public health, and well-being. When I think about the problems uh, inherent in moving the world forward to achieve this goal, um, one, one sort of way of thinking, very famous from game theory, is called the prisoner's dilemma. The fact that if, if two people are caught for a crime and, uh, and imprisoned, uh, if the only way they maximize their good is by cooperating with one another, by both sides maintaining their silence, a form of cooperation, um, and thereby maximizing the well being of, of, of both of the prisoners. If either one of them um, fails to cooperate, uh, the, there's a small possibility that that one who fails to cooperate will come out ahead, but a much larger probability that, that both, uh, both the collective good will be sacrificed. Um, and this is a really interesting way to think about the, the conundrum, the paradox of how to motivate countries of the world to increase their ambitions when they show up at COP26 in Glasgow. Another way to think about it that I, I put a fair amount of time into is the notion of a Gordian knot, exactly how we begin to unwrap all of the interrelated problems that we've heard about in terms of the causes of climate change um, and, and all of the fundamental dilemmas in terms of the, the prisoner's dilemma and other psychological conundra that, uh, that hold us back from making the necessary commitments. It's really helpful to think in those terms. But this is really the fundamental insight that from behavioral economics that I most want you to consider. And that is we all of us as public health professionals, we all know that people aspire to be healthier. People aspire to engage in behaviors that will allow them to be healthy, um, but they often don't actually put those behaviors into practice. It's a, it's a fundamental expression of what we've learned in, in the field of behavioral economics is that people tend to be reluctant to pay today for benefits in the future. So while uh, last night I had a lovely Dove bar after my dinner, which was very, very appealing to uh, my senses, um, but was not fundamentally compatible with how I like to manage my diet. Um, the same is certainly true of, of asking a community, asking a country, asking all countries in the world to step up and make the investments that they need to make today in order so that we do not destabilize our climate, which as I've said, is the most fundamental determinant of, of human health and well-being. So this is the conundrum that we've got to learn to deal with. Um, but Jonathan Patz, in his, in his talk, I think he really put his finger exactly on um, the right way to think about it, the right way to solve both the, the prisoner's dilemma and, and our sort of collective uh, disinclination to cooperate. Um, and that is by focusing not on the long-term benefits of climate solutions, but to focus on the short-term benefits of climate solutions. And as Jonathan expressed so nicely, those short-term benefits are, are really quite profound. Um, and something that he didn't touch on, but, but something that Madeline touched on in, in her talk was not only are they quite profound, that the, the health co-benefits, a term I'm not particularly fond of, I, I really like thinking, talking in terms of the health benefits of climate solutions, um, accrue to us almost immediately, um, and they do so locally. So if my community moves forward with implementing climate solutions, or when my community moves forward implementing climate solutions, um, not only does human health and well being benefit quickly, but it primarily benefits those of us in my community. If we close down a coal fire, coal fire power plant in my community, the health benefits of cleaner air and cleaner water are fundamentally, we are the, the most, uh, we will enjoy that the most. Others will enjoy it sort of. Uh, but in decreasing amounts as we move away from the, the reduction in, in the point source pollution. So thinking about and talking about, communicating about climate solutions as health solutions, 
fast acting health solutions that benefit the very people who implement them. That's a, a really fundamentally helpful reframing of the issue in ways that help us get out of the prisoner's dilemma, out of this conundrum of, of um, behavioral economics that we tend, we tend to be reluctant to pay for things now that will benefit us in the future. Another fundamental insight from psychology, and this is really across a whole variety of different um, theories of, of human psychology and motivation, is that the odds of people taking protective action tend to be maximized under three conditions. Condition number one, when failure to act is risky. In other words, when people perceive risk in the current situation. Number two, when an alternative action is more attractive i.e. when we have good solutions at hand. And number three is when people feel capable of actually implementing that alternative action. When they, and sometimes that means at the individual level, what psychologists call self-efficacy. Um, and in other cases, it has to be at the, at the communal level, the collective level. So if I'm interested in convincing um, my member of Congress to rep to push climate solutions forward in the US House of Representatives, um, I need to work with my fellow constituents in my, members of in my member of Congress's district. So when I believe that I am capable of engaging with my member of Congress and I am capable of organizing my neighbors to do the same, that's when um, the, the odds of me taking action to try to implement these alternative responses to control the current risk. So what we, uh, what we can do is we can share what we know about climate change and health with decision makers so that they see all three of these conditions so that they experience them. Um, the kinds of information that's been presented here, it's all there. I would contend that we know everything we need to know. As Jonathan said, we already have all of the necessary technologies to solve the problem, but we haven't yet um, we collectively haven't yet necessarily shared that with decision makers that I talked about earlier, the people who are in the position to change, the, change our public policies so that we can actually stabilize, uh, take actions that will in, encourage uh, achievement of that, the, pair, the goal of the Paris Climate Agreement and other more re national, regional and local level uh, climate objectives. So this is in my 40 years, I hate to admit it, but I've been at this for 40 years as a public health communication specialist. And this is really the one thing that I've learned in that time that there really, there's, there is a science to how to mount effective public communication campaigns. The science basically suggests um, that there's three things we need to do, that every effective public health communication campaign, in fact, every effective human communication campaign of any type has always comported to these three recommendations or these three conditions. You need simple, clear messages. You need to, to find ways to get those messages repeated often. And you need those messages need to be brought to the minds, to the, to the hearts and minds of the decision makers by a variety of trusted voices. I don't know if any of you are Donald Trump fans. I rather doubt it. I am not myself. Um, but Donald Trump was absolutely a master of simple, clear messages repeated often, and he became very much a trusted voice, and he managed to recruit lots of other trusted voices in, in the United States to convey his simple, clear messages. Um, it, it didn't, wasn't exactly to the benefit of, the, of public health and well-being, but nevertheless, uh, it, it certainly serves to prove the point of the power of simple, clear messages. Um, the, the reality is the less we say, the more we're heard. Um, we need to say the things that have most value to our target audience, meaning we have to get out of our own expert orientation and pay a lot of attention to what the people we're trying to share, what we know with, already understand. For me, learn, as I've already said, learning that, um, that a stable climate is the most, most fundamental determinant of health was absolutely a revolutionizing idea for me. Um, and it took, you know, it, it, that wouldn't necessarily be a useful message for members of the public, but I think it's a very useful message for our, our fellow public health and, and uh, clinical colleagues. So our audience research is, is really an incredibly powerful tool we have to learn what messages, what factually correct things we know will have the most benefit in helping our members of our target audience understand the risks 
understand the, the benefits, the beneficial solutions, um, and feel capable of moving forward impl implementing those solutions. So the, the necessity for repetition, it's simply because of the way the human brain works, the way we process information, the way it shapes our mental models, the neurological basis of, of mental models is pretty well understood by this point. Um, but you have to say it over and over and over again, and you have to get all of your like-minded colleagues and friends to say it with you, because that's what's necessary for members of your target audience to really hear it for their first time and to be able to consider it and have it influence their decision-making. So part of our task is to figure out who is most trusted. Um, often, as I'm I'll show you some data in a moment. Public health people, clinical health professionals, we are highly trusted and that's good, but we're not the only trusted people in communities. So one of the things that we want to do is find other trusted voices in our community to convey the simple, clear messages that we have designed. Um, ideally, the real, the real goal is we want members of our target audience to start repeating our message to one another because they are in fact the most trusted people in any one of our lives. Um, we, are mo we trust most the people we know and love the best. So this is data from the US, uh, fairly recent, uh, showing that the most trusted professions in, in the United States, uh, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, we're way up there in a class by ourselves. High school teachers, I'm happy to see they're up there too. Um, members of Congress all the way at the bottom of the slide, they are the least trusted, but they tend to be our target audience. Um, this is also relatively recent data about who is most trusted worldwide, scientists, doctors, teachers. Again, way up there in a class by ourselves. And that, my friends, is us. We are those trusted voices. We have to use our trusted voices to share what we know with the people who are in the position to make a decision. Climate change is complicated. I don't dispute that, but our research has shown that there's really only five, there, there are five key ideas that differentiate uh, not only Americans, but this is, this is research that's been replicated in other countries, five key beliefs that differentiate people who either reject the, the problem uh, as, as real or human caused, um, or who don't believe it is serious at all. And these five key ideas, they're, they're actually all factually true. And the beauty is I can express them in 10 words. It's real, climate change is real. It's us, it's human caused. Experts agree, more than 99% of all climate scientists are convinced based on the data that human caused climate change is a reality. It's serious. This, by the way, my friends, is where we come in because we can tell the story about how it's serious to human health. And there's hope. There are actions that we can take. And the kinds of actions that Jonathan Patz talked about um, are deeply hopeful because it's not just a matter of solving climate change, but it's actually a matter of creating healthier communities and healthier people who will um, enjoy, you know, all of the, are more likely to enjoy all of the benefits of a long and healthy life. So, this is, these are the five key facts that we know are important. Um, these aren't all key facts that those of us in the health community need to share. I don't really believe it's our role to talk about um, the fundamentals of climate science, that, that human caused climate change is a reality. We know it to be so based on climate science, but it's certainly our role to be talking about the ways in which it harms our health and talking about the ways in which climate solutions are health solutions, which is a deeply hopeful message. So in my work right now in the US and to a lesser degree globally, uh, I'm trying to, uh, we are doing research to figure out how, what kinds of messages most effectively convey these three, um, these three fundamental conditions to get decision makers to make better decisions. Um, the, the fact that the, the perceived risk that I talked about before, the response to efficacy that I talked about before, that seeing that we have better solutions, we have better ways of acting, better policies than we currently have, and then fundamentally um, building people's sense of self and or collective efficacy. So I'm, I'm actually not even going to go through these, these specific messages. Um, this is from a, a message test uh, study that we conducted somewhat recently. We haven't yet published it, but we we tested a whole bunch of different risk messages, solutions messages, and efficacy boosting messages with um, almost 8,000 randomly selected Americans to find out which of these messages are most likely 
to get Americans to contact their elected representative in Congress to encourage them to move on with the business of making sure we, we are not des further destabilizing our climate. I now wanna close on this. So I, I, I led with the fact that sometimes our target audience is smaller than we appreciate. And that's really helpful because it shrinks the, the challenge of communication. It allows us to think more clearly about who we're really trying to reach. In uh, Bernard Laun, the, the gentleman in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, he died last week or the week before. At the, I believe he's, he was close to 90 year old. So he lived a wonderful life, but he and six American and Soviet colleagues um, created a group called the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War in 1980. Five short years later, they won the Nobel Peace Prize for their central role in helping to open up an arms control discussion between the US and the USSR. And the simplicity of their message was just absolutely fantastic. A nuclear war could destroy civilization and, and might extinguish human life. That is a simple, clear, powerful message. And now let's look at the ears on which that message landed. Mikhail Gorbachev was one of the two men that they were trying to reach. The other was, of course, Ronald Reagan. Um, in his, uh, in his um, autobiography called Perestroika, uh, published just a few years later after IPDNW won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Gorbachev said, their work commands great respect for what they say and what they do is prompted by accurate knowledge and the passionate desire to warn humanity about the dangers lo looming over it. In the light of their arguments and the strictly scientific data they possess, there seems to be no room left for politicking and no serious politician has the right to disregard their conclusions. That, my friends, is exactly what we are all striving for in trying to warn the world about the path we're on, about the fact that climate change is a public health emergency and climate solutions are health solutions. A um, couple of years later, after he published his autobiography, he actually sent uh, the executive director of IPPNW a thank you note. And he said, I want to thank you for your great contribution to preventing nuclear war without it and other effective anti-nuclear initiatives, this nuclear ban, test ban treaty would have probably been impossible. If that does not, if that accounting does not build your sense of collective efficacy, our sense of collective efficacy as health professionals, I don't know what will. This is the story that I tell myself every night when I go to bed so that when I wake up the next day, I'm just raring to go because I know that we can have a profound effect in terms of helping to stabilize, uh, keep our important life-giving climate, the, uh, achieving the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement so that we are not destabilizing it and therefore threatening the public health and well-being. And with that, I turn it back over to you, Maureen, so that you can turn it over to my dear friend and colleague, Jenny Miller. Perfect, and, and thank you, um, Ed. And indeed, our last uh, presenter today, but definitely not the, the least important, is Dr. Jenny Miller. Um, Dr. Miller um, really directs the work of Climate and Health Alliance, uh, where she is strategically involved with all that they do. She has over 15 years of experience working on place-based and policy-based and systems-based strategies to improve community environments of, for health. And today she's going to focus on how we can get health into the conversation of the United Nations Conference of Parties, the upcoming COP26. Dr. Miller. Thank you so much. Um, and have I successfully shared my screen? It looks like I have. Um, yes. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, and I too am, am very delighted to be a part of this conversation. Um, I feel like I've always learned something from uh, my colleagues, uh, Ed and, and Jonathan, um, and a great pleasure to hear from and learn from the others who have spoken as well. Um, I'm going to turn the conversation very firmly in the direction of politics. Um, and I think all of the presentations that have come before 
um, are, are a, a wonderful foundation for thinking about what we do about this in the political space and particularly in the political space of the UN climate negotiations. I'm gonna focus on three key points. Um, the first is that the Paris Agreement is potentially the most important public health agreement of the century. The second is that health has the world's attention right now. And then the third is with COP26, with this UN climate negotiations this year, we have a unique opportunity to bring health fully into the climate discussions. Um, they haven't been central to those discussions in the past. Um, we have a real opportunity to bring health uh, into those discussions, but we, the health community, need to help make that happen. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, but just to kind of recap what the Paris Agreement is and some of the features of it, um, so the Paris Agreement was uh, decided at COP21 in 2015. It's a legally binding international treaty. It was adopted by 196 parties. And so the parties include countries, but also the e EU is, uh, is considered a party. Um, and so the 196 parties in incorporates nearly all of the countries of the world. Um, as was mentioned previously, uh, its targets are to keep warming, global warming, well below two degrees centigrade and ideally 1.5 degrees centigrade. The way it does that is by charging countries, each country or the EU, with developing national climate action plans called the Nationally Determined Contributions or the NDCs. And those climate plans are required to include a mitigation plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and then adaptation and resilient plans to address climate impacts. The Paris Agreement has a transparency mechanism, so that's the primary way that it's enforced is by countries having to show their work, show what they've committed to, and, and show how that's being supported. And there's a five-year cycle for increasing climate ambition. So every five years from 2015, Countries are um, meant to deliver new NDCs, new climate action plans, and each time those are meant to be more ambitious until we achieve the uh, um, mitigation, the, the greenhouse gas reductions and so forth to really put us on track for a healthy and stable climate. And so this year, it would have been last year, but the pandemic postponed COP26, um, countries are to deliver their revised national climate action plans. So in the lead up to Paris, um, the health community has been involved in these issues and specifically involved in um, pushing, pushing health and pushing climate action in the context of the Conference of Parties, the COPs. And in the lead up to Paris, health organizations delivered declarations to the, the COP um, representing 13 million health professionals and, and thousands of health organizations and hospitals, ten, tens of thousands, oh, sorry, yeah, thousands of hospitals and health organizations. Um, these contributed along with a lot of other groups and sectors calling for a strong Paris Agreement, um, con helped contribute to getting that agreement across the line. More specifically, the health community um, made sure that the right to health was actually written into the agreement. The right to health is written into the Paris Agreement as a fundamental rationale for why we should take action on climate change. Unfortunately, health isn't, even though that's written in there, it hasn't really been central to the climate discussions at COPS since then. So, um, just last month, to kind of build upon uh, both Jonathan's and Ed's points about the um, benefits to health from climate action um, and the benefits to health specifically of the Paris Agreement. Last month, the Lancet Countdown Project, which tracks uh, climate and health year on year, um, did a study that looked at what would be the implications of 
um, national climate action plans that aligned with Paris Agreement targets in nine countries? What would be the health benefits of those climate solutions? Um, they chose countries that were a mix of high income and low and middle income countries, um, and they ran three scenarios. The current commitments that those countries have, and then a scenario where those countries meet the climate targets set out in the Paris Agreement. And a third scenario where they meet those Paris Agreement targets and deliberately build health into their climate policies. If you wanna see all three scenarios played out, you can check out the paper, but um, if, if we not only meet those Paris Agreement targets, but we also think about health in those climate policies, the, the number of lives saved in just nine countries, the deaths averted, premature deaths averted in just nine countries would be 1.6 1, 1. million from reduced air pollution, 6.4 million from improved diets, and 2.1 million from increased physical activity per year by 2040. So it's that kind of uh, modeling and that kind of data that has led the World Health Organization to say, we see the Paris Agreement as a fundamental public health agreement, potentially the most important public health agreement of the century. So as we all know, in March of last year, COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic. Um, the health community has been on the front lines dealing with this, um, that in my world, since my work is to um, network with and coordinate and convene the health community to be a voice on climate change, that put a significant proportion of my constituency, the folks I work with regularly, um, in, in ICUs and ERs and doing contact tracing and organizing public health uh, planning around the, uh, around the pandemic. The pandemic has had global and society-wide impacts, over two million to over two and a half million deaths wor worldwide, economic recession, lost jobs, disruption of supply chains, um, Hunger and famine uh, in countries that were already on the edge have been pushed further, and they're projecting uh, their projections that 138 million people will be at risk of famine due to conflict, uh, COVID, and climate, the combination of those threats. Education has been disrupted, mental health impacts, and so on. One of the consequences of this very widespread impact of the pandemic is that health has the world's attention. It's not just a side issue. It's not just a nice to have uh, once you get a, a robust economy. Actually, health can destabilize everything. So even while the health community has been grappling with this issue and responding to the pandemic, um, in May of last year, um, we had started to see that some of the recovery, um, economic recovery packages for the pandemic were going to be invested in ways that propped up fossil fuel companies, that reinvested in carbon intensive industries, that um, there were rollbacks to environmental regulations, and the health community actually came together around calling for what, what we dubbed a healthy recovery, or, um, so a, a green and healthy recovery, um, calling for um, the leaders of the G20 countries and their finance ministers and environment ministers to invest COVID-19 recovery funds in ways that support stronger health systems, clean air, clean water, and a stable climate. And the concern from the health community is that we would come out of the current pandemic, the current health crisis, and be in a situation that just would generate the next health crisis and the one after that driven by climate change. This letter to the G20 got response around the world, um, over 500 news articles in, in countries around the world. 
Um, we understand that uh, about two thirds of the G20 countries actually were moved by this issue and this the, by this letter and, and their attention was caught. Um, and so again, health has the world, world's attention. We have a voice. If we didn't before, but I think we did, um, that has only been sort of ramped up in the current um, circumstances. So COP26, um, the UK is the COP president. So each year the host country is considered the, the president of the COP. Um, and this year, uh, UK is driving the bus. I found this image and then thought, oh, UK is driving the bus on COP26. Um, I was amused. Um, what that means, that means that the UK is the host of the COP. Um, if it happens in person, it will be hosted in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, they establish the themes. Um, there are a number of key themes that they've set out to focus on. They try to set the tone and set the level of ambition. In the lead up in the year before the COP, they engage with other countries and try to build momentum around it. And they, they organize the physical event. They de determine how it's set up and, and where it will happen and, and um, all of the logistics on it. So it happens that uh, the UK, um, England and, and London in particular uh, are the, is the home base for a number of these organizations. It's kind of a hotbed of uh, climate and health activity. Um, all of these organizations on this slide are active climate and health voices in the UK. They've met, some of them have been active for many, many years. There are likely others that I've missed. Um, I hope I'll hear back about that later so they can be on a slide like this next time. But what that means is that, that the leadership of the UK that is planning the COP, it has been hearing about climate and health um, and the intersection of climate and health. Also, just last fall, I believe it was in October, um, NHS England, the National Health Service in England, became the world's first ever National Health Service to commit to, to net zero, to commit to um, uh, eliminating its carbon footprint. They set that target at uh, 2040, so they will be net zero by 2040. And they also did so with uh, a tremendous amount of study in advance of making the announcement. Um, they have a clear plan, they have clear deliverables, and they have clear milestones. Um, the UK is very proud of this, England is very proud of this, and they are hoping to kind of showcase this around the world in the lead up to COP. The UK um, Department of Health and Social Care has already collaborated with the World Health Organization um, and uh, other partners, including the Global Climate and Health Alliance to look at how the key themes that are being elevated by, COP20, by the COP26 presidency, um, how they intersect with health. So the key themes are adaptation and resilience, energy transition, clean transport, nature, and finance. As we all know and uh, have seen in today's presentations, all of those have very close uh, health connections, either implications for improving health um, or implications for how we respond to climate impacts and protect health and so on. Or in the case of finance, how we make all of this happen um, for, for health and beyond. So all of that is to say the UK COP26 team is receptive to bringing health into the COP26 discussion. And we're actually have been in dialogue with some of the, the technical team and the staff um, working on, on COP26 uh, about precisely this. But I would say the health community has to help it get there. There are a lot of competing um, interests and demands and issues and sectors ca all calling for attention at the UN climate negotiations. Um, there's a receptivity to bringing health fully into the discussion, but the health community has to help it get there. These are some of the things that the Global Climate and Health Alliance is doing in, this year in the lead up to COP. 
um, or at COP will be co-hosting a conference with WHO um, alongside the uh, COP event, um, pandemic permitting. We're part of a coalition that the Wellcome Trust has organized that will be advocating in the, in the lead up to COP. Um, as I mentioned, we're in, in dialogue with the UK COP26 team and supporting their efforts to bring COP into the center of the negotiations and the discussions. We're holding regional consultations in each of the WHO regions in collaboration with WHO as part of our work um, with the WHO Civil Society Working Group on Climate and Health. Those consultations will engage with health organizations, health associations, and get their input around climate and health. And then we're running an initiative, um, continuing our work uh, advocating for a healthy recovery. And this year, weaving in the need for this year for countries to may, um, deliver national climate plans that are aligned with that healthy recovery that really put us on track for a climate stable future. And those are amb ambitious um, uh, national climate plans that, that build in health. Here's a little bit more about those two efforts. Um, and just kind of going back to the Lancet study, we know that if we explicitly build health into our climate policies, we can see even greater health benefits from those climate solutions. Um, I love this image. This is from the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Um, Ed uh, is affiliated with them and represents the consortium on the GCHA Board of Directors. This image for me encapsulates how the health community, and this is can, clinicians, doctors, nurses, et cetera, but I think it applies very broadly to public health practitioners, to uh, researchers, and so forth, can turn the gears to influence change. Why is the health community, health community's involvement critical? Um, as Ed said, we are trusted messengers. We speak to a shared human value of people's health. Um, with health in, uh, explicitly considered in climate policies, we get better policies that save hundreds of thousands more lives with, um, and, and better uh, social and economic benefits as well. And we are needed to ensure that health is central to the COP discussions and that health and equity considerations are fully integrated into the pandemic recovery and national climate action plans. So my proposition is that we should make, uh, um, go from the Paris Agreement to making COP26 the Glasgow Climate and Health Accord. Paris Agreement is potentially the most important public health agreement of the century. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can all ask um, all panelists to turn on their uh, video so that we can have some engagement with our audience. Um, there were a couple of questions and um, I will share those. The first one actually has very much to do with what we've all been talking about and how communication plays a key role and the um, appreciation that climate and climate and health is a is a disaster. It's 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 a urgent health threat, and the question is well, how serious um, an impact would would be the lack of cooperation of the public um, to take preventive measures to address or to counter climate and health? And it's one for all of us. So any of you, um, if you'd like to entertain that. So the public doesn't play. How serious an impact is that? Well, I'll start off by just um, comparing that uh, map of heat index across the United States. You know that if we do nothing, 300 million Americans will see, you know, heat indexes above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. If we do something, they'll see less of that. So there's sort of an immediate, you know, if we don't act. Uh, that's a problem. But um, I don't want to uh, take Ed's thunder, but he also said we don't have to communicate and convince everybody, you know. And and I'll just say that the first time that Rotary International asked me to talk about climate change and health, they said, 
talk about that, you know, your thing, but don't say the words climate change. And so know your audience and know what they care about. And I was very, it was very easy to give that lecture and talk about extreme storms and contaminated water and, and heat waves and, you know, so, and know what they care about, you know, know it's local and it's specific. And you don't, you know, you can try to reach more people by knowing what their issues are and knowing your audience. But as Ed said, you also don't have to, uh, you'll never convince everybody, but you probably have to convince fewer people than you think. So scientists take this very, very serious. The National Academy of Medicine, both Jonathan, you and I are on a planning committee. We, we have a, a series going on. I'm a member of the Climate Communication Initiative, but there is an importance to what's in a name. And I have seen and heard people be turned off, and this is going to you, Ed, um, if we even said warming in addition to climate or change in addition to climate. Um, and so if we want to see climate as a, just like a disease causing agent, what is it that we're not doing well um, to convince the public, the people who are hurting all of us that this is a number one threat? What is it that we're not doing well? Ooh, we, we have barely gotten started trying to help share what we know about climate change as a threat to human health and well-being. Um, you know, for, for those of you who've been at this for a long time, like Jonathan, I know he feels like he's been doing this for a lifetime. Um, but yeah, part of, <laughs> right, he had a full head of hair when he started. Um, but, you know, his he has been building an army of people like me and, and Jenny who are now joining uh, our trusted voices with his, and, and that's exactly what we need to do. Um, we actually have done data uh, among Americans, and, and we, we knew six years ago, re our survey research six years ago essentially showed that maybe, you know, fewer than one out of 10 Americans had any idea climate change had any relevance to human health and well-being, and now it's more like half. So actually, we really, and, and by the way, over the past six years, there's been this huge increase in public engagement in the issue. Can we credit the work of Jonathan Patz and, and his colleagues for that? No, we can't. We don't, with, correlation does not imply causation, um, but we do know that we're starting to be successful in sharing, in changing the image of climate change away from being a polar bear and towards being my kid with asthma, which is really helpful. And our theory of change, and Jenny, I thank you for, for showing the graphic from our, the Medical Society Consortium, our theory of change is in, in a liberal democracy, you build power by building public will. And when you've got public will, it creates the opportunity to, to create political will. And that's what we need to solve this problem. I don't need people changing their personal behavior. Frankly, I don't care who eats hamburgers or, or what, what they do, I really don't, because we're not solving the problem that way. But if we get the right policies, people will change their diet because it will become more expensive to eat uh, fossil fuel intensive agricultural products. So it's really a matter of getting the policies right and not change, trying to change people's lifestyle. And that creates an opportunity for people to engage in ways that are highly consequential. If I may jump in, it's the message. And it's the message that has to be targeted to those who don't believe in this. I think the last four years, have accelerated uh, the, the, the number of climate deniers. Um, so you have to undo, yeah, no, you do. Well, you know, I go out to the communities and talk to the people. You have to undo the, 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 the misinformation, okay? And added to this, I think you need to actually look at the economics of it because you have, you know, just focus on Texas. You know, what percent of, of, of people in that state or Louisiana or whatever actually work in the fossil fuel industry? They're petrified about losing their jobs. I mean, this, this uh, you know, power grid failure certainly didn't help them. So it's multifactional. I mean, you know, yes, I agree with what you all said and so forth, but you really have to now, I think, target your message to those who, who have been fed a bunch of lies and don't believe that there's a problem and try and, and show them that the, you know it's better for everyone if we start to do what we need to do rather than 
pretend it doesn't exist. I don't send your messaging. You know, we, uh, as you talked about um, physicians, clinicians, public health professionals being that trusted voice. In the Caribbean, we now have an organization um, called Earth Medic that solely focuses on creating and changing the curriculum in medical schools and in nursing schools to be able to make clinicians, the, the future of clinicians, better, better voices for us, better. Um, but I do know that among us, is not a community voice. Um, yes, we belong to communities. And so the next session that we create, we should be focusing on that. You know, um, Jenny, specifically, uh, you talked about, yes, this is a political issue, but the bar fall, as Ed mentioned, and, and John mentioned, it's a policy issue as well. And so how do we use data to create evidence-based policies uh, that drive politicians to take the right actions? Um, I'm, I'm going to actually take a little bit of a step back from that question by way of approaching that question, because I actually believe that one of the most important things that the health community can do is shift the politics. Um, so there's there's shifting the policies, and that's that's vitally important. We have got to do that. But I think actually one of the strongest things, most important things that the health community can do is shift the politics. And what I mean by that is some of what Ed was talking about, which is shifting the understanding of what kind of problem climate change is, um, who should care about it, and, um, and what kind of support they should give to policies to address it. Um, one of the things that is so powerful about the health community is the combination that health professionals, including both clinicians and public health professionals, bring of being evidence-based, um, bringing the evidence about health uh, impacts of climate change and health opportunities and benefits of, of climate solutions, but also the stories stories about impacts on their patients, stories about impacts on the communities that they serve. And that combination of bringing that evidence base and bringing those stories of what's actually happening to people and communities is very, very persuasive. Um, it looks like Ed wants to jump in, so I'll yeah, hand Ed, off Ed, to him. Ed, <laughs> well, I, I just want to make sure I'm given the opportunity to publicly apologize to Madeline for shaking my head when she was talking. That was- I so apologize to you, Ed. I was shaking my head when you were talking, so <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, my hand's down. Um, so, uh, you know, we have, we have a few minutes left. Um, and so I, I wanted to give Jonathan as, as the co-lead for this session an opportunity to summarize what we've heard in the latter half, and then I'll close out. So Jonathan. Hey, uh, Maureen, thank you so much and for your great moderating this whole satellite, uh, set, this whole panel, which has been really wonderful to see, uh, to, to zoom in uh, in a real specific region that has very specific uh, risk and uh, policies beginning to align to address and be resilient to the issue, but also to tap into um, thoughts about a low carbon economy and that the global economy is shifting that way. And so the Caribbean region looks like there are some real lead leaders there uh, doing that. Uh, it's a very, it's one of these regions that is one of the most vulnerable so uh, it can really lead and, and, uh, and show that there's a way to, I mean, there already have been examples when hurricane hits, a hurricane hits that there are differences in how the response happens. Um, I think that seeing across the board, the diversity of topics from the different risks to the different opportunities. And the most important thing is to communicate so that we uh, are not talking uh, within a bubble and that we're actually doing a better job of reaching the different agents of change that we need to. Uh, we've got a golden opportunity, uh, both with the COVID pandemic that has woken up the world that public health and global health actually matters. And that, you know, if you 
disturb the environment, be it the ecosystems and habitats or the climate, you know, you can end up with a deadly pathogen in your living room. That's never been uh, at people's uh, number one attention, and now it is. And so I think from, uh, from the pandemic, we have an opportunity to, number one, uh, leverage the fact that global public health matters. Number two, it's about the environment, stupid, and the social and environmental determinants of disease. And number three, that you know the world has paused and we're about to restart. And it's a, just a huge opportunity to build back better and do it much. And, and we don't need to wait for uh, miracles. You know, they're at, it's a matter of political will. So I think we're at this juncture where we can really have a huge difference. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite hopeful about that. So I'll, I'll, that's all I have to say. Back to you, Maureen. And it's been a um, I, want to say, <laughs> I want to thank each of you um, for giving so freely your time and for engaging in discussions about what is truly a number one public health threat and for demonstrating just by the diversity of the disciplines on this panel that this requires a joint transdisciplinary approach for us to address one of the greatest problems that uh, the world has faced from our communities where we live to the regions where we, where we grew up, in my case, the Caribbean, to the place where we live now. Um, we want to be proud, proud residents and citizens, and we can show that by taking care and taking care of the health of our communities. I thank you so much and wish you the, a, a really good rest of our COGH conference. Thank you.